Hi, Jamie. Hi, we got it. I can hear you we now. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Good. You have a nice day. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes, thanks. And I watched um, North Sea Hijack. It was an amazing experience. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, thanks for sending it because that was a real help because I was pretty hazy about it. I mean, it didn't. Yes. Hello. Ah. Ah. I see Tim. Ah, ah Mr. Clyde. Ah, <laughs> Mr. Bentink. What a Hello, dear boy. How lovely to see you. Still playing, Tim. Music. Still what, sorry? Still playing music. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Right. Good for you. So, um, 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 yes. I, we, we've got some friends who, um, as a, a woman called Phoebe Schofield. Do you remember? Do you remember an actor called Jay Benedict? Yes, of course. Jay died from COVID two years ago. I, I heard uh, awful, awful. Yeah, yeah and um, they've got then. this place in France, and we tend to go there for New Year, and they're very musical. Yeah. And um, and I actually did for Brexit. I actually spent um, most of the year writing a song in French um, wow. about about how awful Brexit was and how we were apologising <laughs> to them. And Very good. Incredibly Very good. complex, but the, I don't know. It seemed to go over the top of the French. They they prefer it in English. Oh well. They didn't quite oh, understand well. what it. They, I think they. I think it was too sophisticated for them. Right, to be honest. I am sure. I'm sure. <laughs> How are you, Jeremy? It's been ages, mate. Because... I'm very well. I'm very well. I mean, I hear of you, of course, through my pal Cocky, and of course, oh, yeah. Sam. So I've got two pals working with you uh, regularly. Sam, and, is it? Uh, I'm very well. I'm in fine form, working in America a lot, doing music things. You see, that's oh. why I'm about whether you were playing still. Oh right. Are you in America now at the moment? No, 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 no. I'm in. I'm. I'm leaving next week. Okay. So what I'm music on... are you doing? Well, I had some hit records in America a long time ago. You did? What was it? Thing and Thing and Jeremy? The Chad and Jeremy, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Chad, is, Chad is no longer with us. Oh. I, I'm just about to... Um, oh, yeah, poor old David's trying. Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm just about to, for my sins, I'm about to do something called the Flower Power Cruise with um mickey dolence of the monkeys and paul jones and the zombies and, God, and peter asher and myself and god oh knows boy and so that's i'm off to do that and then i've got other gigs coming up uh with peter because peter and i he, he was peter and gordon yeah and, um you know was chad and jeremy and both gordon and chad are, are, have left us right and so it's an obvious thing so we and it sells out because you know they get double the hits and double the stories and all that and Fantastic. you know the old gag between us is the right ones died because you know he gordon used to sing the low parts which i used to sing and chad used to sing the high parts which peter used to sing speeder <laughs> sings so we've got the the, the, the formula it still exists you still got the, the harmony Fantastic. is peter jane's um brother Jane, yes, of course. Yes, absolutely. Because I work with Jane a lot because I do the thing for the National Autistic Society. We do that. We do the carol concert every year. Oh, right. OK. And so she's become a bit of a mate now. Than, um... No, she's she's good news. I mean, I've known yeah. her for a billion years. Right. Uh, saw her, well, I don't know, about five years, four years ago. Um, we were both coming out of shows we were doing and bumped into each other in the street and we all went off together. That was with Peter as well. Anyway, oh, there awesome. was, yeah. Great. Um, Good. So how we got, we has Wood. Yes. Mr. Wood, I think is. Now, interestingly, because the thing yeah. was, there were two different things with this, weren't we? Which I'm sure we'll come on to with Philip, that, that we, I mean, all I knew of, of North Sea Hijack was being in Ireland. But you, did you shoot your stuff in, in Ireland or? No, no, no. You were doing, you were doing all the tough guy stuff. Yeah. I was doing back at the office. Yeah. We we, um, we did no. We came to Ireland for a few of the shots involving getting in and out of helicopters because that's where they had that that was base of the, yeah that's where they had the base right and, um, that's when I you know but I mean basically I lived in my own little world of man behind the desk you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It's funny because Philip sent us did you get that link to have to have a look at it I hadn't seen it for ages. Um, well, I, I watched it this afternoon because... You watched I, the whole thing? 
Yeah, the wow. whole thing. Wow. Well, I was kind of, well, I mean, okay, I was doing a few things as well, but let's yeah. be honest. But I was just, you know, I was amazed. I had, of course, haven't seen it since whenever, you know. Since it came out. It yeah. used to be on, you, you practically couldn't take a plane anywhere without it being. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I, rem I remember that it was the sort of the go to family Boxing Day movie. Yeah in the afternoon for many, many years. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was. And yes, uh, sort of on, on the, and if we'd had a, a, a even an inkling of um, an investment in it, we'd be very rich, but I think we probably got a buyout in those days. Oh, I think we definitely got a buyout. I never had a repeat for it, have you? No. <laughs> no, come to think of it, no. <laughs> there you are. Ooh. Well, that explains it all. There we go. Uh, well, we, we we shouldn't do all this now because Philip clearly wants us to. Well, no, I don't want to talk about North Sea hijack yet because we must stay off that. Because yeah, you know, the other thing that's worrying me when Philip comes back is it says seven thirty to nine thirty. Oh God! What are you kidding? I can, I've got about three <laughs> anecdotes of over three sentences each, and that's it. That's my <laughs> lot. So you keep talking. No, I can't do till 9 30. No. No, Judy just said to me, she said, How long have you be? Half an hour. I said, Oh, probably a bit more than that, maybe. But yeah, yeah. I'll come yeah. down and join you in a sec. Yeah. So you know, now Philip's we've lost his sound. Yes, I can I I sort of go, I'm following it like you. <laughs> so um I, I know uh, Cochrane, Mike Cocky, my pal, he's yeah. a Left me a message actually. He's coming back tonight from Birmingham because he's oh. been up there doing his stuff. Yeah. Um, God, what a gig, man! That is that has yeah. been extraordinary. Yeah. It, it it yeah. It has forty one years now. It's been forty. Yes. Uh, God. And I, mean, I, I thought this is my great thing, stupidity. There I was being you know quite successful. And earning quite a lot of money in my twenties yep. and thirties, and and, yeah. and and doing the arches, I looked at Norman and and Paddy, <coughs> play my parents, and thought, oh well, that's great. That's my pension. Um, I will be, you know, permanently employed in the arches in my old age, and that's my pension. So I never went and took out a private pension. So all the stuff that uh, you know, I was terribly generous to my children and private schools and Christ knows what. Um, and never put anything away at all. And I'm now, um, I'm going to be 70 in June. And I've gone, I'm on a state pension. I've just got to keep working till I drop. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, There's no putting the feet up here. No, no, I, I'm in exactly the same position, by the way. I mean, my children lapsed for nothing, for nothing. Yeah. The little bastards. The uh, bastards. They're, exactly. they're absolutely great. Um, anyway, <laughs> Oh, did you get? Did I? Did you see the um, the by the sword divided uh, thing that I sent you? Yes, that um, that um, uh, uh, Ralph Winter was his name. That's it, it. That's it. That's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Stammering. It was. It was an awards ceremony at the end of the. the end stammering of the in a different way to James Mason. No, no, yeah. stammering in a different way. Alec Guinness was mine. Oh, Alec Guinness. Sorry, Alec Guinness. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was very good. Very good. The interesting was, thing about Guinness was he played because he had a very good Scots accent. So he he obviously wanted to wheel that out, and so he played Charles the First with a, 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 a faintly Edinburgh twinge, right? And um, which is bollocks because he, he actually uh, Charles the First left Scotland when he was four. Oh wow! So it's sort of vaguely unlikely. Yeah, I mean, of course, we have no idea how he did speak, but. I you did know. this. I did this uh, similar thing. Robert Robert Hardy asked yeah. me to. They were, they, were, they were doing a Sonne Lumiere in Portsmouth or something. And he asked me yeah. to be the voice of Nelson, and because I, we'd kind of got a cottage in Norfolk and, and I've got sort of Norfolk roots, and I know, and it's written that that Nelson had quite a strong Norfolk accent. Did he? Now? Yes. So when he said, um, "Do you anchor Hardy?" And Hardy took it to mean a, a question, do you, question mark. And in Norfolk, do you anchor means you bloody anchor. Damn it's, right. It's a command. And it's the re reason why half the fleet got lost in the storm after Trafalgar was because of that mis misunderstanding of the order to Collingwood. Uh, um, 
Okay, let's not, let, that's very good. I like that very much. What about the next bit about Kiss Me Hardy? So have you got, oh, a, have you, have you yeah. got a Norfolk twist to that? Uh, no, <laughs> that's Kiss Me Hardy. That's quite clearly gay. Exactly. <laughs> 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 I'd say didn't ask well anyway the point is I did this yeah so there they were in Portsmouth expecting you know the, the these wonderful tones of Nelson Jason, I can't, I can't, I'm on I'm doing a zoom call at the moment for North Sea Hijack so I'll talk to you later okay bye bye and old Muggins here comes up with me Norfolk you know, doing that thing and I have a I mean he didn't say um, Robert well Tim Hardy um you know, he was quite on for it, but I have a feeling that the the general public didn't reckon oh, that that Nelson was going to be um, have a very strong Norfolk accent. Well, let's put it this way: I can hear Sir Lawrence Olivier. Yeah, quite exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. giving it the full should be really. I do think there is. I do think there is an absolutely wonderful series to be made about Emma Hamilton now. Um, the story of a young woman being, you know, passed from hand to hand. I think it's, and then the, the final, you know, and if you, I went to an exhibition about her and was absolutely astonished. Um, and we, we have some of her writings. She was wow. almost literate. Oh, uh, so she's, she's right. the- it says your mod. default microphone has changed to microphone log. Now let's just see if that- We can hear you. I got, I hear you. David Wood is coming up. Ah, that's better, hey, that's better. Hey, 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 hey. Hey. Can oh, you hear me as well? Yes, we can. Yes. Oh, oh I'm hearing you on the telephone. Or I you... don't know what I did. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello. Oh, hi. Jeremy, I was looking at something uh, today and I suddenly discovered that I, th I thought, oh, I've never worked with Jeremy apart from in this film, but in fact, we were in Disraeli together. <laughs> we were, we were. Yeah, I, I don't think we had any scenes together. I don't think there was uh, any scenes, but I was very much part of a sort of all-purpose gang of Tories. Yeah. And I, the only line I can remember from it is I had to come in and say, I say, chaps, have you heard? We've <laughs> dished the wigs. <laughs> that's, that's my memory of that. That was Claude Watham, wasn't it? Yeah, well done, well done. Yeah. David, I, um, I bring um, love and greetings from Debbie Arnold. Oh, my word. That's yeah. kind. That's kind. I was look. I, th I thought I'd worked with you, Tim, years and years ago in, in the Troubleshooters or something, but I don't think you were in that. <laughs> no, I think this no. this was it. All right, but I'm not. I'm not sure that we actually met because you were the enemy. Um, but no, that's right. I was at sea. I mean, I was suffering at sea. Were you, were you on the boat all the time? Mm, yeah, we used to set off at six o'clock in the morning looking for bad weather. Oh, my God. You're and uh, yeah. So Anthony Perkins and I used to sit doing anagrams, which was quite fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, no, it was all all right. Uh, but uh, no, it, it did seem to go on rather a long time. <laughs> the, I, just had uh, a, I had a ball in Ireland. It was just, it was great. Yeah, well, we were in Galway, and of course, at the hotel, they kept on chucking us out because there were bomb scares. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that was fun. We should <laughs> save these anecdotes for poor old Philip, who's been having a terrible, terrible time, clearly, trying to get us all together. Yes, yes. Now, Philip, are you all right there? Now we can't hear you. Now we can't, can't hear you for now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. So mm. we got we got people. Oh attendees. No. Oh you're oh, you're doing that. I, I don't know about that. Yeah. Maybe Philip is trying to get our our audience. <laughs> but eight uh, we got eight people. Eight wow. people? Yeah. God, that's fantastic. No. Oh, mine says twelve. Well, that's eight plus four. That's no, plus us. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Picking us up a bit. It's not. Well, we're not outnumbering. House. As long as we're not, not outnumbering the audience, that's the old thing. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> Equity rules. We are allowed to not attend if we are. Yes, exactly. I have done that once. <laughs> <laughs> have you? Well, no. We were offered it when we outnumbered the audience, and we said, "No, no, we'll go on in true Thesp style." Oh, that's great. That's good. That's good to hear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but was it, was it, it a tour? 
What? What is a two-hander? <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me now, okay? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. My God. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to see if I can get a, a, a good volume, but... But if, okay. to be honest, I'm coming through. I'm coming through. So that's that's. Okay, okay. That's, great, that's fine. Yeah. I, I did a Zoom on Saturday. Absolutely fine on a my external mic, and now it's decided to give up the ghost. So. Uh, oh dear. Oh well. Wow. Isn't technology awful? Philip, I've got to tell you that I've just suddenly realised that Jeremy remind, said that, that this is due to go until nine thirty, which I can't do. So it, 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 I hope that's okay that we um, if we make it. A bit short. Yeah. Well, what, what time do you want to to go, Tim? Because I'll make sure I've got the questions I want for you out of the way, just in case. Oh, okay. Um, um, well, the family are downstairs waiting for me to come down and join them. So, um, but I mean, if we could make it, if I could get there for kind of half past eight, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. So half half Pretty eight. Good. Okay. Good. Well, without further ado, um, yes. thank you very much, guys, for joining me to talk about uh, Norsey Hijack. It is very much uh, appreciated. Um, I just wanted to ask you all individually, um, but, um, maybe we start with, with, with Tim, how did Norsey Hijack come into, um, into your life? Well, I actually, I don't want to say this, I've written an autobiography because of being David Archer. I've written this book called, um, called it's vlogging, Being David Archer and Other Unusual Ways of Earning a Living. And in it, there is, there is three pages on North Sea hijacks, my adventures of doing North Sea hijack, hmm. which, if you like, I could bore you with, you know, unutterably. If you go away and make some tea for the uh, hello eight people who are watching us, um, and it, in it it describes um, the audition pro process, which was at um, a hotel on on Park Lane, um, with Andrew V. McLaglen. Did you two have this as well? Were you? Did you do an audition? Yes. Yeah, we'll keep going. Yeah, cool. I want to know what happened to you because, well, I'll read it to you. Hang on, I'll, I'll read you the, I'll yeah, read yeah. You to the answers because I mean, I've got lots it of time. <laughs> okay, so the, the, the <laughs> this is what this is what happened. Um, it said, hang on, okay, so okay, so this is it. Um, for the audition, I'd been summoned to the Park Lane Hotel to meet Hollywood movie director Andrew V. McLaglen, son of the actor Victor McLaglen, and casting director Alan Fernanda. McClaglan was standing. He was six foot seven. I stood before him, six foot three. I felt like a child. Tell me something, kid. Can you do a Scotch accent? I hadn't been told the character was Scottish. Um, yes, no, I spent a lot of Christmases in Scotland, actually. And I mean, um, oh, right. Uh, well, yes, I've had a great Scottish blood, actually, which is true, but a long way back. So that's not a problem, uh, blagging it here. Can you swim? Also, not forewarned, but hey, result. Uh, yes, I'm a good swimmer. I was captain of swimming at school. He walked towards me until his chin was an inch from my nose. Then he put his feet heavily on my shoes. That's to this so day, I have no idea why he did that. A yeah. power thing to see how I'd react? A fetish of some sort? So I stared him out. What else could I do? Laugh? Nut him? He stepped back and then he said, Kid, I think you just got yourself apart. Those were the very words. They are burned upon my soul. <laughs> did that happen to you? Did, he, did he stand on your feet? He did. Uh, he made a habit of it. As you do, you could be standing, watching proceedings, you, you know, waiting to give lines, you know, to somebody else, and suddenly there's this enormous bulk of a guy would come up and lean against you and put his and, and put the, and the, foot, the feet on the, his feet his foot on on my foot and it was and it was kind of sweet it was actually friendly it was oh. like a great big it was a it was a, it was a it was a sign of um, approval okay it was like a big bear coming oh. up and you know, you weren't sure whether you're going to get cuffed or, um, yeah, or, or allowed to live. You know, but he—it was a sign of it was something he did. He just come up and lean against his vast man. You know, um, yeah, absolutely. Did, and did, the thing, you, David, I, did you have? Did either of you guys meet um, Elliot Kastner? He was oh. the producer. I don't think I did. I know about him. Yeah. Well, Elliot, I, I remember Elliot saying to me, and I 
must, I mean, I don't, I imagine McLaglan was there, but I don't remember, I remember him later very much. And I remember what <laughs> Elliot said to me, he said, you look like the Lord Privy Seal to me. I thought, really? No idea. Uh, and he said, hey, it's a meat and potatoes movie, which I love, it's a, it's a meat and potatoes movie. I what, mean, that's, what is what kind that of, yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's an adventure, it's, you know, nothing subtle or right. fun. Like this just sort of bish bash do it um anyway it's a meat and potatoes movie and so that whenever i hear north sea hijack or the folks talked about it's uh, meat and potatoes yeah so there you are <laughs> what about you david did you well even though it's rather different i didn't get the benefit of part lane um i can't remember whether it was pinewood or one of them and i was sent down there and i think it must have been a bit late in the day uh, and he did indeed. He was sitting behind a desk, so I didn't get the height until we were on location, really. Oh. But he said, um, he said, just like with Tim, he said, can you do the Scottish accent? And I said, well, I did a TIE tour uh, where I was playing several Scottish characters. <laughs> and he said, oh, that, that's, uh, that sounds fine. And um, well, it, it was OK, except that on the very first uh, day of, of shooting for me, uh, in a car with Anthony Perkins and um, and that rather terrifying man Michael Michael Parks, and we had to drive up to the uh, to, to the oil rig supply vessel and call up to Jack Watson, who was on the uh, uh, wherever you stand up there as the captain, and uh, and I had to do my Scottish accent saying, "Can we come aboard?" And uh, and suddenly I had the embarrassment of this American director turning around and saying that he thought my accent wasn't good enough and could I improve my accent? Ooh. And uh, so I, I had another go and apparently that was all right. But um, no, he was he was a strange. Well, he, I, he was perfectly all right with me, apart from the day when he came up to me and he said um, this was oh halfway through or more than halfway through. And we were still in Galway because I was in Galway for about six weeks. And uh, he said one day, David, he said, we've, been, we've had a discussion. And I said, oh, yes. He said, yeah, yeah. We decided that your character is a baddie. And I said, oh, I, and I said, no, I don't think so. I said, no. I said, he, he helps the baddies get on the ship. But I don't think, uh, yeah, he's a baddie. OK, so I said, well, fine. I said, but that, does that change anything that I've done? <laughs> No, oh, no, no. He said, you just, just carry on, carry on. That's all right. <laughs> Very odd thing to say. Oh, yeah, uh, but there we are. But uh, no, it was, uh, it was, it was fun. I mean, it was, that came as a surprise because I was actually on the plane to Galway, I think within three or four days of the interview. So I think they wanted someone else for the part. And I was a last minute addition. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> Tell me about Michael Parks. You you mentioned him. Talk to me. Boy, well, he, I never I, met. I him. never met him except when he was in costume and he had these pebble glasses. I know, I know. Yeah, and uh, and he was just very unpleasant. Oh, was he? Yes, he was a nasty bit of work somehow, oh. and uh, and and nobody liked him. I mean, and my great friend. Well, there were there were two. There was Sean Arnold, who I got to know very well. And there was Philip O'Brien, and Philip O'Brien was a wonderful um, Irish American actor who lived in Dublin, uh, playing one of the baddies. And he was a sweet, sweet man, and we had a lot of uh, laughs. And but we were terrified of Michael Parks whenever he stood there, and nobody sort of went up and really talked to him at all. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I believed, I believed in his character totally. Whereas Anthony Perkins was the reverse; he was delightful, and we were. Yeah. Used it in this um uh in the galley of this oil rig supply vessel hour after hour after hour looking for bad weather and uh and, and we all had to be on board even if we weren't shooting that day just wow. in case just in case they might need us and, yeah. um and, and perkins was a great friend of Stephen sondheim and they used to do word games together so he came up with all these word games and anagrams in particular um, which I rather enjoyed because I did crosswords and we used to just sit there doing that for hours. Right. Um, but uh, no, his um, the other American was David Hedison, uh, and he was perfectly pleasant, but we didn't see that much of him. Um, uh, it was mainly uh, uh, Roger Moore, obviously, and um, J James Mason and, and Perkins. And 
uh, there, there was this one extraordinary night shoot we did where we were sitting in this galley of the oil rig supply vessel. We, we weren't at sea then, we were moored. And uh, it was when the helicopter comes in. Um, and uh, I suddenly thought, I'm sitting here with James Bond, uh, with the, the, the man from Psycho, <laughs> and, uh, and James Mason, uh, Lolita, you know, mm. this is extraordinary. Mm. And they were sort of chatting, three o'clock in the morning, or whenever it was. And, uh, and I had these little blue glasses, gold rimmed glasses, which were my own. And they'd wanted me to wear them. And so there was no spare pair. And suddenly as we were talking and I, uh, we were about to do the scene in which we all took part. And suddenly there was a little, and, and the little screw came out of the side and the lens fell out. <laughs> and I panicked a bit because there was also a stunt man waiting, to, uh, a stunt double for me who needed these glasses. He hadn't got a, another pair and he was going to be shot or I was going to be shot and he was going to drop onto the deck. And uh, so I was scrabbling around in the semi darkness looking for the screw for this thing. And I suddenly realized there was someone else kneeling on the floor with me and it was Roger Moore. And bless him, he had a, he found a torch and he was looking around, really interested. And he found it, and then with his fingernail, screwed it back in and made it work and everything. I was so wow. great. He was, he was a yeah. lovely, lovely man. I he have was to say. a lovely man. Lovely man. Yeah. It was as though he wanted yeah, everybody. He was being paid a lot of money uh, in order to entertain everybody, whether yeah. it was crew or other members of the cast. You felt that yeah. the whole time. Extraordinary. Yeah. And he was always there for the reverses. That was the thing. I, was, I mean, I I had never, I, I was straight out of, you know, Bristol Orbit Theatre School. I'd never done any filming um, before. And I was just doing what I was told. I was, it was like thra. I was like a rabbit and blinking in the headlights going, I'm just, I'm in a Hollywood movie. <laughs> <laughs> and there he was. And I'd had that scene with him where he leaves with his cat and everything. And, and, um, and he'd, and so we, we filmed his bit and then they did me and he stayed behind to do to be the eye line yeah yeah and i yeah. didn't know that that was a thing that people met you know a lot of people didn't do well, a lot of people didn't did they a lot yeah. of people yeah. eye line a piece yeah. of white poly yes there's your but, eye line yeah, yeah. but you know he's he stuck there with his head right right next to camera smoking yeah. a cigar and yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No, there was this wonderful moment where we were um, we, we were all meant to be watching a helicopter flying in. So uh, McLaglan said, um, uh, OK, he said, I've got a stick. He said, and the, at the end of the stick is the helicopter and I'm going to move and you follow the helicopter. And uh, and the hierarchy, of course, is that the junior members does the first close up. And it was the four close ups. So I did mine and sort of looked up and there was that sort of quizzical thing. Is that a helicopter I see before? I'm not quite sure. And, and masses of activity going on. So I did mine. And then next was uh, James Mason, who sort of did sort of look and there was a sort of shift of the head, but that was about all. Um, next was Perkins, who did nothing at all, absolutely nothing. And you thought, well, but there's a, there's a about that. And of course, when you saw it on screen, it was wonderful. It was all mm. going on. And uh, and then Roger Moore did his one, final one, being the star, and just the one typical eyebrow <laughs> raising. <laughs> and that was it. I learned an awful lot that day. The, mm. the less, less is more. Less is more. God, less is Roger Moore, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> uh, Tim, I want to ask you about the action that you had to do, because it's quite a physical role you had. Do you have any memories of doing the either on occasion island or um probably the back lot at Pinewood? Well there was again as I say, I mean I was so on I would never done filming before. So it was just completely new to me to have to learn how to do it on a major Hollywood movie is quite fun. Um mm. But there was a, one scene where I had to run um kind of it, it, it's the bit where Roger Moore throws me overboard. Um mm. and I had to kind of run past camera. Um, and I, I remember um, McLaglen getting cr cross with me because I, I ran up to, there was the camera and I had to run past it and he was standing there and I stopped. So of course my shoulder was still, you know, in shot like that. Um, and it needed to clear completely to go past it. And I didn't realize that how important this was. And it was about take six 
when he lost it with me, he said, for Christ's sake, can you take a piece of dough? What's going on? I was absolutely terrified of this thing, not knowing what I'd done wrong. Um, but there wasn't really very much. I mean, once he'd thrown me overboard, that was kind of it, really. I mean, I didn't have that much much action to go and of course i didn't get thrown overboard it was a stunt man who went splash um but no i mean you know we were on board the ship i mean i agree with you david i mean the, the highlight again I've, I've written it down that on a night shoot in a cabin with roger moore and james mason and anthony perkins and we were telling gags and i was telling my schoolboy jokes and they were laughing at them yeah, yeah. These, these 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 famous men laughing at my pathetic schoolboy school jokes and the thing I do remember is that Roger told a joke um, which involved um, swatting his hand against the wall to hit a fly that was the punchline of the joke but he'd forgotten that he did he cut his hand rather badly and it was bandaged up <laughs> and so it ended the joke ended with him going fucking shit <laughs> <laughs> I read this and I think said James Bond. I was in heaven. I was just looking at you going, James Bond just said fucking shit. That is so cool. That's one of the things that I remember of it, first of all. But on the day he um on the day he arrived first on, on location in Galway, uh there was a, a sort of caravan where about six of us were just having a chat and it was a little sealed off field almost with a um, uh, with a chuck wagon and, and so on and uh and we've been told he'd be coming and sure enough he he walked along he's being escorted to his trailer and uh someone must have said oh the, the other people and they said ah the actors <laughs> and he put his head round the door and said hello actors <laughs> and it was this whole thing the self-deprecatory thing of saying you know what the hell am i doing here amongst yeah. real actors or whatever uh, but, and again, he endeared himself to everybody just by doing that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, extraordinary. <laughs> when he was feeding lines, there was a moment when we were both feeding lines to James Mason or somebody, I can't remember, I probably was. And we, he, we started a ridiculous competition about how you could, you know, how to phrase the line. Could you say this one? Could you say that one? And he said, but of course, and was so skillful. And you suddenly realized how, what a good actor he was. Mm. You know, I mean, you know, I, I'd say, I, I bet you can't say it like that. And he said, right. <laughs> and off he'd go. Uh, uh, and it was, you know, right on. And I thought, you know, he said, oh, yeah. yeah. This is, you know, don't underestimate this guy, whatever. No. Yeah. Yeah. And it was quite brave, really, that part. With all the, um, the the sewing and all the embroidery he was doing, yeah, so, yeah. Um, he, the, the fact that he was willing to do that, I always thought was 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 rather remarkable. Yeah. Well, the, the question I I have, and I don't, I be amazed if anybody if anybody here or maybe the audience of four uh, will tell us. Um, was that part offered to anybody else uh, first? Mm. I'd love to know. Because, as you say, it was a, it's a real stretch, and, and obviously he was dying to get away from, you know, all the rest of the saints and bonds and all yeah. the rest. Of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I just wonder because it was so unlike him. I mean, you know. Anyway, yeah. And there's another, that's rather, I wonder. I wonder. There's a rather that dodgy, rather dodgy scene in the in the shower. Um, I, I saw. I, I ran the movies so to find to, to remember. Thank you, Philip sent me a link and there's a, you know the scene with leah brody what did, did she work after that a lot i don't know I, knows, no. yes i don't know maybe it killed her yeah. career are you a boy are you a girl and all that sort of mm. shakespearean type stuff and mm. yes you probably like couldn't that. do that now could you no uh, it was now. you know it was but but it, its heart was in the right place it was trying to you know um say she's a kick-ass girl <laughs> you know and all that mm. yeah uh anyway <laughs> i mean w w were you guys aware that it was um at the time that it was based on 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 uh jack davis book book um esther Luke, and jennifer was that were you able to read the book in in preparation that's what it was called that was the working title when we were doing it actually wasn't it esther mm. Luke, yeah 
Yes, I've still got the letterhead. Oh. Um, I, ah. I felt very privileged that my name was on the letterhead. <laughs> there are about seven of them. Yeah. I think, Jeremy, you might have been there. I'm not sure, Tim, whether you were. Okay. But, um, uh, the, 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 yes, it was Esther, Ruth and Jennifer, and that was how it was, well, right the way through filming, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. uh, I they guess they changed it much later on. Yeah. And in, in America, it's they fun, just yeah. called it folks, didn't they? For folks. Yeah. Hmm. Right. In the end, mm. which is not a good way of selling a movie, really, is it? You can, no, with mm. a, a word that Americans probably can't even but, um, pronounce. Mm. No. Sorry, <laughs> Americans, folks, of course you can. Two S, small S, just fine. Yeah, <laughs> you, you can understand that Norsey Hijack was perhaps a bit more cinematic, yeah, um, title. And I think the tagline for a lot of the, the posters and the trailers was he doesn't need a license to kill. So it was playing on Roger Moore's oh, on the image at the time as, as well. Um, so, it was it was Richard Harris that was originally offered the role. Oh, really? He didn't want to. to, to, to Richard, to, uh, Harris. Richard, Richard Harris, Harris, apparently, yes. Ah. Um, but he's, you see, they're, they're, when was The Wild Geese, Philip? You all know this. The Wild Geese, was that before or after? Because they, was, they were all in there. And that um, was, that was McLaglan as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, there was obviously a, a connection with Roger Moore and Richard Harris dating ah. back from Wild Geese, which was just a, a couple of years uh, uh, before. Yeah. Ah. Um, oh, yes. Well, that's... What, what, what was your? What did you think about the film when you you, you first saw it? Did you, did you go to the the premiere? What was your feelings about it when you when you saw it all put together? Um, was there a premiere? Was there a premiere? Well, or, 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 I don't remember a premiere. Been, I, don't no, I can't remember a premiere. No. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I just thought it was a great, you know, action film. And, and uh, I mean, to, to, from my point of view, I mean, you two guys are, you know, much more um, experienced and have done things before. And I really was just complete raw and was just... <laughs> Can I read you? Now, I'm going to read you another Yes, yes, yes. Because... <laughs> Because this was, um, it, it's, uh, um, 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 hang on a second, hang on a second. Um, yeah. Um, um, um. Oh, right, okay. Every time the film is on telly in the afternoon, which is about once a month, I rue the fact that it was a buyout. The fit young man in the film hasn't the faintest idea what he's doing is by no stretch of the imagination a hard military man, has never commanded troops in his life, and is running around a ship and scuba diving in the open sea in Galway Harbour, completely overwhelmed and totally bowled over at being surrounded by some of the hardest, most experienced stuntmen in the business. Mm. He's also having the most fantastic crack with the crew every evening in the bars of Galway, glugging water after a dive and finding it was pachin, and being paid more money in cash per diems, as the daily allowances for expenses are known, than he had ever earned in wages before in his life. Yeah, yeah, and they're going to tell the story about the Roger Moore. But that's what it was for me. I mean, I was just like a little boy, you know, and you can see, I mean, this man's meant to be Roger Moore's right-hand man, hard man of his private yeah. army. No, I was going, ah. hello! <laughs> ah. It was those little brown envelopes. They were very exciting every oh, day. Really great. Wallpaper. Yeah. Do you remember they'd say there's a wallpaper job? Because mm. the Irish punt, the, it was about that big. Yes. Each pound was, was you know, you could use it for wallpaper. And we'd go out to, to have meals and just splash these punts everywhere and buy everything. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. it was, I yeah. mean, it was, I tell you what, Philip, there was no seriousness going on at all. I mean, how he'd ever, it was only down to chaps like you two who knew what you were doing with him. I don't know about that. I was a baddie. Well, I wasn't a baddie at first. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, uh, you do have a, a, a bit of action in, in the film, Tim, with the with climbing of the scaffolding in the beginning of the, yes. the film. Uh, did you get any stunt stunt training? Was that? Do you remember the like George Leach people like that that were on the film? I've got a photograph of me with standing with all the stunt men, hmm. um, and yeah, they were hard. And we went, we went, we did quite a lot of sort of training. Um, again, there was a bit where we were having to climb up the. <laughs> um, the anchor 
chain to get into the boat because they were going to do it with um, grappling hooks and they decided they couldn't they couldn't do that. Um, so there was going to be going up the anchor chain. So we went into a forest and um, um, what's his name? Martin Grace, was it? His, was, was, Roger Moore um, was that Rogers? Rogers Stuntman. Yeah. And Martin, he was a sweet, sweet guy. And he'd gone, he'd climbed the tree and had hung these two ropes down from the tree. And all the all these, oh, you know, serious fucking hard men, you know, all the all the legs, doing all that. I've got to climb up the tree and get on the ropes and got the ropes right. And they tried to do it. And they were all, you know, in their 50s and 60s and the, the, the scars all over their bodies. You know, they're in a really bad way. And I was as fit as a flea. And one of the things that I was, you know, did at school was climbing ropes in the gym. You know, I was just like second nature to me. I was completely good at it. And so they all did it. And we decided, oh, I can't do that. We can't do that. Like, let's go up. Oh, wait a minute. Let's let's see if let's let him Tim a go then, right? Give, give Tim a go, because they were having a go because I was a toff. So they was going, yeah, let's see if Tim can do it, all right. So he go. So I was faced with this situation of whether or not to go, no, I'm sorry, mate, you know, I'm useless, hopeless, can't do that at all. Or, well, fuck it, so I just climbed the, shin up the rope like that, bend over, and there was Martin Grace sitting on the bow of the thing, and I got on, on, on the bow of the thing, and he winked at me. And after, and then nobody said anything. And after that, and I didn't say anything either. I just did it. And after that, they were all right with me. And they started to take the piss out of me then. And that was all right. So once they started taking the piss, it was all right. Yeah. <laughs> and we got on well. And in fact, I got invited to the stuntman's ball at um, Pinewood afterwards. Wow. Um, and invited to be a stuntman. Um, and I when I turned up there, about half the people were, you know, in plaster and kind of five people in wheelchairs. And I thought, mm, no, I think I'll go for I'll go for the <laughs> I'll go for the Ponzi actor. I'll go for the lovey. I'll be the lovey yeah. instead. <laughs> well, the guy who did my death fall when I was shot, so lifted up on this cradle with Roger Moore and someone else and me. And then you hear the shot and you sort of do the collapse. And uh, he went up there and I saw him do it and he had to fall down onto the deck uh, from really, really quite a height. And he got up afterwards and just sort of walked away. And the next morning he came down to breakfast and, uh, and I, I said, you know, how, are you all right? I, he said, oh, yeah, 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 a few bruises. So I said, oh, I'm sorry about that. No, he said, I'll get him out in the bath. He said, I'll rub him out, rub him out in the bath. <laughs> and uh, have you imagined this... Uh, this uh, therapeutic treatment after having yeah, dropped absolutely. from a height. This was but, the no, I had every respect for him, I have to say. Oh, God, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, yeah, all of those stuntmen, absolutely major respect for all of them. Mm. Dinny Powell, wasn't he? Dinny Powell was there. And, there were, well, there were several Powells, weren't Greg, there? Greg Powell. Greg. Um, and there were, was it Father and Son, I think? I'm kind yeah. of remember. Yeah. And uh, yeah. no, they, they did them all. Mm. <laughs> Do you remember Diddy Power in particular? What, what Diddy was like? Um, just he was Diddy. He was like you know, he was a he was a right old stuntman. It's, like, mm. it's like the real deal. It's like you know, it's like. It, it, but this was my overriding experience of being a child amongst grown ups. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned uh, working at Pyman Studios. Um, do, do you guys have a favourite studio that you've worked with in your careers and would Pinewood perhaps be be up there with them? Pinewood was, it was a, a, a real treat. And mm. I blotted my copybook very badly. There's a scene where we are, there's Roger and James Mason and myself in a helicopter. Mm. And we are um, going to look, we're going to look down at the, uh, look at the rig down there, you know. And there's, a, there's chat back and forth between the three of us. And my wife came down, then wife, with the small children to visit me because I was at Pinewood. And it was so exciting. We could eat in the dining room. And then after lunch, we went for a little wander around. They took the children around the grounds because it's so pretty and everything. And time passed. And I did not realize how much time had passed because I was so busy showing off 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I walked onto the set and there was a, and as I walked on the set, there was a, everyone was sitting there, everyone was, they're in the helicopter in the, in the studio, you know, sitting there, James and Roger and all. And the whole unit goes, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely, they are all waiting for me. I have no idea. The shame. So I can't look at like, and uh, Philip sent me the copy of um, Fuchs uh, today, nor see hijack. And, and, and I, 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 I can't look at that scene without <laughs> remembering that moment. It's all one of the big shaming moments of my life. I'm never <laughs> late. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm there. You know. <laughs> awful, awful. How oh, funny. But yeah, it was wonderful. It was uh, Pinewood. I'll tell you the, the studio that actually had the most atmosphere that I've ever worked in is was, was the old BBC, I think, studios now. Um, the ones at Ealing, the old Ealing studios, mm. which, you know, because Ealing comedies, um, I swear to you, there was an atmosphere there that was just unlike anything else. Mm. Extraordinary, extraordinary. Yeah, I agree. I was, I was going to say, Ealing, and I think I only did one thing there, which was a lovely thing called Mad Jack, which was a Wednesday play about Sassoon and Michael Jaston playing Mad Jack, and I, as usual, playing the friend um, who was called uh, Ormond or something. And it was a lovely, lovely job. And a lot of it we filmed on location in Weymouth, but actually, when I think about it, apart from the awful thing of riding a horse, which I'd said I could do and couldn't, um, uh, the actual <laughs> memories that I most cherish really are the studio scenes um, mm. when I had to sing a song and so on. But it was, it, you're right, you, you walked in there and you thought Ealing comedy. Yes. Mm. Yes. What must have gone on in here? Because it was quite small, wasn't it? I mean, it was, oh, yeah. it was a, an enormous place. No, no, no. Um, I did Grange Hill there. I was in many episodes. Oh, I was a regular character in Grange Hill for a bit. Um, mm. I played a, I played a man whose um, whose wife had, had died of AIDS, um, and he thought she was having an affair, and um, uh, it, it turned out that it was from a blood transfusion when they'd been on holiday in California. But I walked in on day one, knowing nothing about this part and everything. And, my, and this girl came out. She said, "Hello, that's I'm your daughter." So I went, "Oh, I've got to be London." So I played him. That's why I you know developed my London accent. And I've lived here for forty years as well. But it, so I had to be a, a Londoner for you know many many years. But that was you know just like a regular job turning up. And then I did a, a couple of different parts in EastEnders as well. Done those sort of. Mm -hmm. but, but, but I love it there. It's great because it's got that fantastic sort of faded English glory of you know yes, and yeah. totally unlike you know upmarket it, it, all singing all dancing Hollywood studios with everything. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. It's all falling apart. It's wood and it was it was falling apart and. and in certainly I did a couple of things there and actually it, it's a soundproofing because it was built before the aeroplanes were coming to Heathrow because they were going off to Hendon or somewhere you know <laughs> Freud uh, and so you would have to stop the soundproofing was not it was 1940s soundproofing uh, for, a, for a 1970s world yeah. I did um, a thing called Sexton Blake and the Demon God I was of course Sexton Blake uh, <laughs> And and actually, yeah, there was an incident there. You were talking about stunt people, and I was thinking about that because there's a moment where Sexton Blake has to fall down a lift shaft, and it's I mean like twelve feet or something, uh, not terribly difficult, not a dangerous stunt, but he did the stunt and broke his ankle, and I felt really bad. You talked about the guys all patched up, right? Yeah. And I felt, I, felt, I felt a terrible guilt, as if it was me, it was my fault, because he was being me. <laughs> but as far as, you know, he, he screwed it up, actually. I mean, there's the, tr there's the truth of it. And not a difficult stunt either. No. Anyway, yeah. Lord. Hmm. Anyway, that's, we, we digress. Yes, whatever. Yeah. As actors do. Well, we do. <laughs> Um, I think one of the impressive elements of, of Noisy Hijack is the fact that there isn't actually any shots of oil rigs, platforms of any kind. It's all models um, yeah. done by the wonderful John Richardson. Uh -huh. um, did that, were you su surprised at that? Did you know that? Or was it when you saw the the, you know, the, the film in the cinema? And what did you think of, of that amazing work? 
Yeah, no, I, I wasn't aware of it at all. No. Um, no. no, I mean, uh, well, my character never set foot on the oil rig. Mm. And I don't think I was ever surprised that we didn't really see one. Um, yeah. But but you're you're right. I mean, the models uh, were. It was very. It was it was very well done. That, yeah. Very well done. Uh, and I, I certainly believe first first time I saw the film, I certainly thought that well, yeah, they're using a, a oil rig. rig. Um, yeah, me too. Oil rig. Uh, no, very good. No, yeah, I mean the closest we got, I got to an oil rig was as you say that scaffolding was where we rehearsed being on an oil rig. We never mm. actually got onto it because. Roger had thrown me overboard. And I swear there wasn't CGI and all that in those days, was there? No. no. Mm. I, um, I was just going to a few questions for, for Tim, because I'm conscious that we're going to lose him in a minute. Um, I was just wondering, Tim, where does North Sea Hijack sit in, in your, um, your, your body of work? Well, it was the first film that I'd, I'd ever done. Um, I, I, I thought, this is it, here we go. You know, I'm now I'm playing Roger Moore's right-hand man in his army. This is it. This, I'm now going to be a, a, a career um, playing soldiers and, um, and, and, being, and probably move to America, you know, now. Um, it didn't really work out like that. Um, <laughs> that was the last major Hollywood action-adventure movie I was ever in, <laughs> the one and only. Um, I did do Sharp's Rifles. We did um, episode one of, of Sharp, Drew Sharp's Rifles, which we filmed in the corrupt Crimea, which we're, I'm in fact, funny enough, about to do a reunion of as well, um, because that was fantastically, fantastically exciting. And, and all of us said, you were in that, Jeremy, weren't you? No, so, I wasn't. Wouldn't you? No, weren't you? To, my, to my rage and fury. No, I bugger. Wasn't. No. No, that, that that was that that really. I mean, because that was going to Russia. Well, it was Crimea, but you know, at the time we thought it was the same thing because uh, it was 1991 and it was just after the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall. And so you know, there was there was you know, we were we came to Russia um, as as like conquering heroes with more money than you can possibly think of. I mean, talk about per diems. The dollars that we had in our pocket for a, for a day were the equivalent to what a teacher would earn in a year in Russia. <laughs> um, it was a hugely exciting, um, an interesting and informative time to understand, you know, quite what it was that that Soviet Union was. Um, but again, digressing. So, in terms of a body of work, it was. I should have learned more. Uh, and better how to do film acting <laughs> like less is more because later on I got um I went to um I was in a thing called um uh, the Pirates of Penzance which was a movie based on the Joe Papp Central Park version um of Pirates of Penzance with um, Tim Klein uh, um Kevin Klein and Linda Ronstadt and and all of that and we I got cast as a pirate and we filmed it at Shepparton, going to um, the studios that we were talking about. We filmed it at Shepparton and we mimed to the New York cast. So we were just there and I was there because I was tall and had lots of energy. Um, and at the end of the filming, um, they said anybody who can actually sing has got a part in the West End show. And I auditioned and I'm not a singer. So they laughed at me, but they said, no, this is a choreographer, choreographer called Graziella Daniele. She said, Tim, you got so much energy. She said, we got backup singers in the wings. Don't worry. So I got this part in the West End show for nine months. And they said at the beginning of it, do you want to understudy, um, be second understudy to Tim Curry? So I was, then you get five pounds more per week. So I went, yeah. And that, and that changed my life because <laughs> Tim was off. He got ill. Um, Chris Langham was the first understudy and he was uh, in, in court that day um and and I went on having had never no, I'd never rehearsed it so I was playing a lead in the West End musical and I'd never rehearsed the part and I've done it but I watched Kevin Klein sing it I watched him curry sing it so I knew the lines and that led um to being in a thing uh, to getting a leading role in a thing called By the Sword Divided which which Jeremy played King Charles the first um and I again I'd done practically no filming before and I look at it now and <laughs> You know, I mean, the style was different. It was a bit more theatrical, but nevertheless, I was acting. And I look at it now, I go, oh, God, why didn't anyone tell yeah. me? Stop it. Why yeah. didn't somebody just say, Tim, stop it? 
stop stop acting you all you have to do is think it you know that's the thing and that's the lesson you know the two years at bristol Olympic theater school learning on the news and i'm going to do something now you know all of that it's a completely the wrong thing to do in front of a camera yeah. but nobody told me that and i look at it and i go so you know my life might have been slightly different if i'd been just moody and <laughs> hardly said anything and mumbled a lot then I think it would have been I probably would have been better so um in terms of in terms of Har Harris the Scottish right-hand man of Roger Moore I think actually it was quite a good performance for me considering my ability to overact yeah <laughs> and, uh, Tim do you have a, a favorite moment from the from the film that you haven't already uh, haven't already mentioned a favorite moment from the film mm. Um, well, yeah, actually, yes. I mean, it's basically Roger's performance, I think, really, is the answer mm. to that question. I think that he stole it and he was wonderful. And, and not being James Bond and being this sort of rather extraordinary, rather angry and certainly miso misogynistic um, man, which, again, you wouldn't get away with now at all. Um, but that little scene with him and his cats, you know, at the beginning when when I'm there with him um yeah I'm very fond of it I you know I'm, I have very very fond memories and particularly actually not so much of filming it but of the crew and, mm -hmm. and the, you know the times and going out in the evening and the pubs in Galway and the restaurants and that extraordinary um hotel which when we walked into it the first time was a, a photograph on the wall of a of a smoking ruin and I said, what's that? She said, that's the last time it was bombed. That's <laughs> <laughs> so, well, introduction to it. <laughs> yeah, it was just, oh, uh, you know, I thought this is what I this is what I joined up for. This is this is yeah. you know, this is why I joined up, because it's going to be adventures and excitement. And you know, it has been on and off between the unemployment, but you know, you do get, I mean, it's the best job in the world, really, when you're yeah. having fun. If you get, you know, isn't it? It's great. <laughs> Were the cats well behaved in, in that yeah. scene? <laughs> um, I think so. I think it was probably a cat wrangler. Mm. Yeah. Um, there must have been quite a long time ago now. <laughs> and uh, do you have a favourite project of your career, Tim? That I'm sure the audience would like to know if you have a what what you consider to be your 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 best work. <clears throat> My best work is never will never be seen. My best work it was in a student film for the National Film and Television School, where I was a cowboy, um, and I I actually got to play. It's called The Pride of Wade Ellison, and I got to do a shoot a shootout and ride horses and get bull whipped and have a relationship with my boy because the wife had died and and he's gone to be a pig farmer and. He's they're trying to railroad him off his land and he's not having it. So one more time he gets his guns down, you know, gets his guns that have been hung up. He gets to go, to go out for the gunfight. And, and I never thought, I mean, with all the things that joining up to be an actor, I never thought in a million years I'd ever get to play a cowboy. Hmm. And we filmed it just we filmed it in Black Woods, just north of Pinewood. And um, there's an extraordinary um, uh, Western village in Kent that people, um, that, that it's a hobby thing they built. And they built this entire thing. It's got livery stables and a bar and the whole thing. And we filmed a bit of it there. And the guy who filmed it, the, the student, it, he's gone on to be a very successful director. And it's really good. I mean, the, the, you know, the production values on it are fantastically good. And I'm a cowboy, you know, <laughs> that's, uh, again, you don't expect that. This year, I finally got to, I, I'm, I'm a rapacious and, um, and torturing uh, cult leader called Brother John, and age of 69, I get to reprise my American accent. And, you know, it's these things that you get. It's not the kind of the turn up and you know, play the first lawyers and bank managers. And yeah. Us, us, you know, if you're posh, you tend to get given these bloody parts of wearing suits all the time. Yeah, I, you know, I always wanted to be out there with my guns and you know, yep. swords. I did actually, because I was in the, by the sword divided, and I was in Pirates of Penzance. I did spend about the first five years of my life as an actor with a sword around my waist and an earring in my ear. 
and I thought it was always going to be like that. And it was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been good. It's been all right. And then being David Archer for forty years at the same time, you know, it's completely barking mad, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> And it's a funny old business, isn't it? Isn't it a funny old business, David? <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny old business. Mm. Well, well, Tim, were you able to bring anything to your the character of Harris in terms of, did you have much of an input in, for example, the, the moustache or anything that you kind of thought, well, or did you create a, a backstory for your character, some actors do? How did you approach the, the, the actual role? Philip, completely not. No, I mean, I was yeah. so bad in terms of professionalism about having a backstory. I had no thought, actually, that this character was a real person at all. I was just simply doing what I was told. Somebody said, stand there and say those words. You know, it's like, it wasn't, it was not Shakespeare, was it really? Going, I don't know. Did you have a backstory to your character, Jeremy or David? Did you yeah, no, I didn't, I, except... Um... I did up to the point of I, I didn't believe that the Lord Privy Seal looked like me. Uh, I was convinced that I had been miscast. You were very and, young. I mean, uh, looking at it, it's, you, way you were... too young, way, way, way too young. And I spent a lot of time. I, I you know, I just saw the film and I, I, through, you know, sort of, ugh, 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 Jeremy, you know, don't do that. Ugh, a lot of that. Um, silly hair and I um, also I had them paint in it does you don't see it actually but there's bits of grey put in the sides because I was so conscious of being I thought were totally miscast um, so that was my main <laughs> my main problem was uh, just sort of trying to pretend that I was in fact the Lord Privy Seal yeah um, whoever he be well, whoever he be, but yes, but imagine that the Lord Privy Seal is probably in his 80s, isn't he, usually? I'm, I'm sort of ready to play the Lord Privy Seal now. Oh. In fact, I'm ready, I'm, I'm ready to reprise Mr. Tipping with a certain a certain gravitas that I did not have in those days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've been fooling you, Philip, all along, you see, that you're taking this thing seriously and we weren't, I don't think. We were just uh, having fun. Guys, the point is, these guys had the fun. I had, I was back in the studio. It was another day, another thing of, you know, going, every, people, you know, endless setups around the tables, five or six people, you know, it goes on forever. Um, McLaglan's coming and leaning on me again, you know, uh, I'm trying to giggle with Roger. I was terribly impressed by, I remember being incredibly impressed by. Uh, James Mason, who, by the way, was one of the nicest men in the world. I mean, he was just an absolute sweetheart. Yeah. And we giggled away on uh, on the side. And um, he, you know, when it comes to it, OK, James, and there he is on the telephone and he's doing all this stuff. And he doesn't drop a stitch. I mean, he just walks on and he does it. And then they shoot it a few times. But I mean, he's he knows what he's doing right from that moment. I mean, right. it's it's and it's just him. You know, and he's listening to somebody reading a line from down the end of the telephone. Um, and it's just, you know, God. Yeah, I think that is true. Learning a lot. That was the thing. It's a learning experience from yeah. my yeah. point of view. I mean, just wide eyed and going, oh, yeah. this is how you do it, is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, just before I let you go, Tim, um, we have had a question from the audience. Is your book available um, to, to, to buy in all good bookshops? Well, it is, but I've actually just gone and bought up quite a lot of the stock from Amazon because I tried to get. So I'm going to do a, a live um, um, thing on. Um, I am going to be on. Oh, hang on a second. Um, on what day is it? Um, um, day six. On Wednesday, the fifteenth of March. Oh no, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's going to be. Oh God. Okay, Thursday the thirtieth of March, um, in Walton on Thames. I'm on stage being interviewed, as funnily enough, David by Debbie Arnold, um, uh, with me David Archer hat on, and he said, "Can you bring along a whole load of books?" And I've only got about five left, so I went to the publisher, and they said, well, "We haven't got any in stock," so I just went and bought some for cheap from Amazon, so you might not be able to buy it, but have a go, I'm sure they'll be restocking it. Also, the other thing you can do is go to Audible and get the audiobook, which is me reading it, which is actually 
Um, it's quite fun because I wrote it and so I didn't have to prep it. Um, um, so it, yeah, it's there. It's it's fun. It's you know make you laugh. I take I do take the piss out of myself. They can buy, buy mine as well, Philip, if they want to. There's mine. Hey, look oh, yeah. at yours. Hey. Is it reversed? No, no, I can see it, Elizabeth. Okay, yeah. 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 yeah, well, that, that's got a whole chapter on North Sea hijack. Oh, it? boy. Oh, I'm going to bow yeah. it. Yeah, a whole chapter. Fantastic. Um, the, the main thing is about the thing I did with the Burtons, but the, the, the um, uh, North Sea hijack gets a good look in. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> oh, come on, Jeremy. I'm definitely going to buy that. Definitely. Come on, Jeremy. <laughs> well, let's see. Your What's yours? Uh, for the past nine years, I've been putting out the bottom draw sessions. Jeremy tried the bottom. Oh, draw oh cool. This just, this just happens to be number seven. Um, there's actually now, so if you go on Spotify or Amazon or any of those things, you can do that. I do a a, a post every week on Jeremy Clyde Facebook, ah. you can go to the Chad and Jeremy page, you can see all kinds of stuff there. Fantastic. And I'm just off to America to um, do some more music. So that's my that my life at the moment. Brilliant. So, uh, so since we're all so the bottom draw session, why not? Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Well, the, the, it's, it's so funny because I just it, it, with this thing um, by the sword divided that that. Jeremy played the Charles I in, which was a 20 part BBC series about the English Civil War. Um, and I, to fin finish off the story about going on as a second understudy, I ended up um, playing the lead in a West End musical because Tim Curry got really ill and I took over the part. Um, <clears throat> and then the people who were casting for By the Sword Divided get, were in. And, um, and so I got the part. So suddenly I went from being. It was, this was 1982. I bought our house, that this house that we're still in. Um, I got the part of David Archer in the Arches, and um, I got by this all divided. So it was a, it was a big, big year for me, 82. And so, and here we are, 40 years later. <laughs> Yeah. 40 years later and it was well, minded to think that we had such a great time on um, by the sword divided let's you know see if we can get people together and um julian glover played my father and i, I rang julian and i hadn't spoken to him for ages and he was like you know yesterday he said oh hello tim because like, 30 years haven't passed and i said would you be on to sort of all meet up he said, God, absolutely yeah 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 so I, I sort of researched it and I found, I went through IMDb and, and wrote everybody down and lots of people, about half the cast are no longer with us because I was young and lots of older actors on it. But there are still, we've managed to get 17 people saying that they would like to meet up. So I'm um, I'm sort of going to try and find somewhere for, for us to go and have a drink or a, or a meet up. Question. Is, yes. Yeah, you got in touch with me and I said, yeah. yes, Um uh, any idea when? I mean, I don't know what we're dealing with our social arrangements here. Well, that's, <laughs> that is the difficulty. I, I, I'm trying to think of a way. Of, I think there's an app that you can do it where you can suggest dates and people tick the ones that they can do and that, that you oh. know, that you, it'll come up. Yes, it's a, a doodle thing or something they call it. Is it doodle? Um, yes, and, and you put the dates. And, uh, oh. and and your best date on the second day and all the rest of it. Yeah, right. uh, I've I've had that before. Okay. No, that, well, that's that, what I'm going to I'm going to do. And I'm looking at kind of rooms above pubs because I'm okay. a member of Century on 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 Shaftesbury Avenue, but that's cost a, a fortune to hire a room. Yeah. There. Just yeah. pointless, really. You just yeah. much easier to find. You know. Well, I hope I'm around anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope you are. Are you going to be? Are you back and forth, can I? Yeah. Right. Well, wow. Tim, Tim Curry was my understudy <laughs> <laughs> a few years before. Wow. In a play at the RSC, which was a, a play by David Mercer. And I was playing um, a, a very gay decorator, which I wouldn't be allowed to play anymore, <laughs> um, with Frank Finlay. And, um, and Tim was my understudy, and he'd just been in hair. Oh. And he hated being at the Aldwych because when he was called to the stage, they, they, there were some of them who went on and did a few bits and pieces. 
um, they called him Mr. Curry, of course, Mr. Curry to the state. And apparently when they were at Shaftesbury doing hair, they were all called by their Christian name. And it'd be like, Tim, you're on, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and um, so he hated it. Oh, wow. uh, but, uh, he did all right, didn't he? In the end, he did very he did well. Right. Yeah, he's he's ill. He's he got very ill there, hasn't he? Yeah. Well, I, I think I don't know. He's he's in America, probably now permanently. But I did a terrible thing a few years later. Uh, uh, my agent rang up and said, "Would I like to go to a first night?" Because uh, Gwen Watford was in it, and Gwen Watford was his one of his clients. And we went to the Globe Theatre, and we were standing in the foyer. And uh, I said to uh, my agent, I said, oh, um, I said, Andrew Lloyd Webber's over there. I said, I, I know, Andrew, would you like me to introduce you? So he said, all right. And um, and, I, and sort of waved. And this person came over and I said, oh, I said, I do have to say, I, 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 I was happened to be in New York and I saw Jesus Christ Superstar. And I said, it was very, very good. How are you? I haven't seen you since or whatever, all that. And this rather bemused look came over and as he walked away I suddenly realized it was Tim Curry <laughs> why on earth why on earth I'd made this mistake I haven't a clue uh, and I never heard from him again <laughs> terrible and they don't really look anything like anything each other. like each other no, no not really no it's weird I suppose it's got slightly kind of quite big eyes don't they so it's like mm. yeah mm. maybe it's the eyes that did it yeah he was very good I never saw him I, I we transferred eventually to the criterion for six months and uh, and I had a different understudy there and uh, there was that rather embarrassing situation where they were having an understudy rehearsal and I suddenly I was in the in the theatre and I was could hear the the tannoy and um, in the end I had to go out I thought well, no it's unfair uh, but he used to go on for me because I got this special contract they extended it it was three months first of all and Vanessa Redgrave was meant to be in the cast, but backed out because she was pregnant. Um, and Billy Whitelaw came in, who was, of course, lovely. But they'd only done three months for all of us because Vanessa had said three months. But they could have done for the rest of us six months. And Billy Whitelaw said she would have done six months. So when it came to it, Frank Finlay and Leslie Sands, lovely Leslie Sands, mm -hmm. decided to leave. And the rest of us said we'd stay on. But my agent got me this wonderful contract whereby I was allowed out to do tellies if anything came up. And within a week or two, I got a classic serial for The Beeb, which involved filming in Norfolk and all that. And, uh, and by then, Barry Foster had taken over from Frank Finlay, and he was furious. <laughs> and, and I used to come back from filming, and he used to say, I don't know how you can get a film. Blah, 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 blah. And he used to glare at me on stage. But um, uh, but no, the, the, the nice days. And Tim, Tim, he was he was lovely. He was, uh, but he was just very affected by being in hair, which was obviously a very um, liberal experience, if that's the right word. Yeah, I bet he was fantastically good as the Pirate King, as was indeed Kevin Klein. Yeah. And trying to follow them was um, sure. was a, a tough a tough act, mm. two tough acts to follow. Mm. And then Oliver Tobias took over from me because they said, they said, Tim, it's great. You're doing all right. But, you know, you're not a name. You couldn't have a name. So one, one minute I was the star in the number one dressing room at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane and would come out and screaming women, girls, and throwing their knickers at me. And I was, you know, I was the star. And then and that was on Saturday night. And then on Monday, Ollie took over and I went back up to the top floor with the lads. Um, and I came out and Ollie was being mobbed by women and I walked behind him, uh, and walked home, got my bicycle, walked, went home. And I thought this is uh, my first lesson in the in the fleeting uh, nature uh, of fame. Shame. Was that the one that David Ian was in as well? I don't know, David Ian. Well, he went on to be a rather successful producer. OK. I don't know where he was in at no. one point. Mm -hmm. Don't think sorry, so. we're digressing. Yes, no, we're great. Just, just back actors, on track. Actors. Well, I'm, con I'm conscious, Tim, that um, I should probably let, let you go um, to continue your evening. Um, thank you very much for joining well, if me. That's Tim, all right. I mean, if, I mean, no. I, I probably, I mean, to be absolutely honest with you, my recollection of, of, of North Sea Hijack, I've probably given, I've t told you the stories, there's not much else. Um, uh, yeah that's sort of um 
Oh, there was the what the, the other one was. Uh, um. Yeah, quite, um, uh, he said, "Yeah." So, so talking about this, the um, the the stunt men. There was a night scene where we scuba divers had to surface near a large ship in Galway Harbour and began to climb up the anchor chain. We were all kitted up. I was with a group of three other frogmen. Before take one, the word went out. Remember, fuck up the first two takes. Take one, someone comes up too early. No, from the loud hailer. On action, you descend, count to ten, then surface. The water was almost opaque with harbour pollution. I had encountered a very large turd on the surface and later developed a severe ear infection. Take two, and action. Go down five feet, wait, come up, looking menacing. Start to swim purposefully, to, purposefully towards the ship. You know what? One of you swimming the wrong fucking way. Not me, thank God. Take three. In the bag. Nailed it. Moving on. It turned out that the stunt team were on £100 per person per take. And that was in the 70s. You think how much that was? It's about a grand per take. And I found out later that they had made sure that I was paid too. It was really nice to feel a little bit accepted by such a bunch of seriously hard nuts. But that was, you know, that was for me. Uh, the, these guys, you know, done everything and they were the real deal. And I was mm. just pretending and they were nice to me. So it, that, it, that, I had a really warm feeling about the whole the whole show because of that. And and of Roger and, you know, and everybody. It was it was it was an adventure, you know, and I left school and other people had gone off to be bankers and lawyers. And then I went off to drama school and became this actor and then you know this was absolutely vindicated that i'd right made the right choice and yeah. you know 40 years later i go yeah but if only i'd done a pension then they would still then it would be all right <laughs> <laughs> it's just financial insecurity you know the rest of it's been great it's bloody financial insecurity that's been, been the bane of my life. I've always said there's nothing wrong with my life that about three million pounds wouldn't fix. Anyway, listen, would you? Uh, 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 I've got my, 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 my wife and my son downstairs. I'll, I'll just let you go, Tim. I'll just let so you go. Often. So, if that's all right with, with everybody, if you. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Um, oh, thank you very much for talking to us. Good. As far as I'm concerned, Tim, you're a traitor. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have to say. You left us. You left us. <laughs> well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have anything more to. to I think I probably um, contributed as much as I can. You've done. You, you, you've been great, man. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's been a delight. And Jeremy, I will see. You, well, we will. I will have another chance of having a go at this with more more anecdotes when we do um, by the sword divided. Absolutely. You've done very well. Thank all you very right. much. Say hello to Debbie Arnold, too. I will do. All right. Lots of love to you Thank all. You. Thanks very much for asking me, Philip. It's been great fun. Thanks, Tim. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Next, bye, 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 bye. Tim. Um, so I'll just have a couple of a few couple of brief sort of wrap-up questions, if I may. Um, Jeremy, you did have, have some scenes with David Hedison. Do you remember yes. David at all? Very well. I knew David before because I'd been working in America and so I'd run into him in LA. Um, and so it was, that was nice. I got one silly story, I guess. Uh, and it, I, I was thinking about it, watching the film and it must have been while we were filming um, uh, uh, North Sea Hijack. Hmm. David Edison, who I knew anyway, said, oh, why don't you come over? I'm, I'm having lunch. I'm, I'm getting a lunch for a few people. And so my wife and I got dolled up and off we went and walked in. And there was, now I'm about to, because I wasn't thinking that. So, who was the great John Arlott, the great cricket commentator? This will mean nothing to you, Philip. Absolutely <laughs> nothing. Um, the great cricket commentator with that fantastic voice, the one in he's rolling, and I know he's coming up and he's going to bowl. And um, of all people, so David Hedison, John Arlott, myself, a few other folks I can't really remember, not many, I mean, it was a small, bit, a small lunch party. And then in comes um, uh, 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 Collins, Joan Collins who completely takes over the room 
uh, and arrives. Ta da! I'm here for lunch, you know, everybody. And it was so, and, and the conversation, I, I mean, it's the most, it's the sort of, there's some sort of mad dream in which you're in a room with Joan Collins and John Arlott and David Hedison. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> and John Arlott told me something that day that I have never forgotten. We, strawberries arrived. And he said, Oh, strawberries. Oh, you don't want to eat them. No, no, no. Not with cream, with pepper. Pepper. That's what you want. That's what they did. Well, man, back in my day, we did that. And sure enough, if you take a delicious, scrumptious strawberry by that, you know, the green bit, and dip a little into it, into some pepper, yum, yum, yum. It's absolutely delicious. And so they, well, that's my David Henderson. Joan Collins, John Arlett moment. Um, there you are. I have nothing more to say on the subject. But I mean, but 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 he's right about the he's right about the um, the, uh, the the um, the strawberries. Hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, David, did you um, experience any sort of any seasickness during your scenes? I mean, your character, oh, of course, was, was played to be very ill by it. The extraordinary thing was, uh, I was absolutely fine. And I was so fine that because my character had to <laughs> have some sort of uh, seasickness, uh, they used to make me up with all this green stuff mm. um, uh, because uh, I was looking so healthy. And I've no idea why, because I don't. I'm not a great sailor or anything. I don't go sailing. But um, Philip O'Brien, who was this lovely uh, American who uh, was, well, I, I don't know whether he was American Irish, but he was living in Dublin and he's, he certainly had this Irish sense of humour. And uh, he contrived a plot, which was that there was a nurse on board um, and she had this big um, uh, sort of casket of pills and God knows what inside. And he knew that there were all these seasickness pills and she was doling them out to people. And he made it his business whenever her back was turned or she went out to go and steal a few more of these things. And it was knocking them back because he was terrified of being uh, being ill. But uh, but we weren't the, the only person who suffered really from seasickness. And I always felt he was he was feigning it. He it wasn't really ill at all. Uh, he was uh, one of the props guys. Um, and he was the butchest person around and the strongest person around. But he suddenly decided that he couldn't face uh, at, uh, at any more time. So they let him stay on land while we all went out searching for the bad weather. Um, but no, I think we were all quite, uh, um, uh, uh, quite remarkably fit because we all had to pile into this um, galley sort of area recreational area which was quite small and where the crew went because this was a Norwegian a real Norwegian oil resupply vessel with a full crew and this was where they were meant to be but they we never saw them really um and uh and as I say for days on end it seemed we would be there without having to do anything at all mm. um but then th then there was a certain amount of uh filming and one of them was where I had to be uh uh, suddenly grabbed and stuffed into a cupboard that was quite fun um and uh because at the time I wasn't quite sure why I think they suspected me of being a baddie uh, and at the time I hadn't thought that I was a baddie so it it was all very confusing really hmm. uh but it was it was fun and they were they were a nice group of people um and uh and no I was very grateful for doing it but the, the, when when I got the offer it was very quick and our second daughter had just been born and I felt extremely guilty going off for six weeks and uh but um uh, but my wife was very um very tolerant and said okay and uh and then it came after about three weeks uh this same Philip O'Brien delinquent spirit that he was uh said um do you fancy going back to london for the weekend and i said oh i said we're not allowed to do that are we so he said well they're not going to be filming he said they, they, they're not filming saturday or sunday and uh 
I said, are you sure? So he said, yes. He said, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get a taxi across from Galway to Dublin and, um, and you can get a flight. And, uh, and he, he was, I think, coming, no, was he coming with me or he was just wanting to go to Dublin? That's right, to see his family. And uh, so we did this mad dash across and, of course, feeling very guilty. And I didn't get home until about one in the morning. Um, and then all the time felt uh, that I should be going back but eventually did go back and nobody found out. So it was all right. But I'm sure it was strictly against mm. the, uh, the rules. Mm. Mm. But uh, no, the. Um, uh, for, for me, it was not. I mean, I had unlike Tim, I mean, I had done. A, a, a bit of filming bef before. I mean, um, and you asked Tim earlier on about, you know, best job or whatever. And I suppose doing If uh, for Lindsay Anderson with Malcolm McDowell in whenever it was, uh, 67, 68. Mm -hmm. uh, Malcolm and I are still in touch. And we, he was in touch the other day because I'm doing yet another Q&A after a screening this coming Thursday. Uh, and it's still, I mean, after 53, four years, uh, it's still got this cult following, um, yeah. uh, which is quite remarkable. And uh, and I wrote a little book about it called Filming If for the mm. 50th anniversary. It was suggested by the Lindsay Anderson Foundation. And, um, and I, so I've been sort of flogging a few copies of that. But um, th these people, they come up afterwards um and they start doing a scene they they give you a line and you say sorry and they say you you know your your turn your turn and uh, and they know all the dialogue they know it better far better than ever we did mm. um and uh and, and also it's quite moving because they come up and um have stories of uh, of their own public school terrors mm. um and there's an organization i've forgotten what it's called now but it's rather like um the samaritans almost where they help ex public school boys um some some of them in their 70s and 80s and some of them just in their 20s and 30s but who have felt and still feel uh, traumatized from the experience and although that wasn't i don't think the purpose of lindsay's film at all i think he was it was a metaphor for the state of england or whatever maybe um mm. nevertheless it has that effect on people and uh, uh, and I feel very privileged to have, to, to have done that. And Malcolm mm. came over, Malcolm came over for the 50th anniversary of Clockwork Orange, which was a year or so after IF, and um, and he said, let's meet up. So we did, he was doing a Q&A at the Curzon in, in uh, Mayfair. And um, afterwards, he'd been told where I was. I was positioned at the top of the auditorium and he came up and we had a big hug and then he said, come on, we've got to go, we've got to go. And he rushed me away, obviously terrified of being mobbed. And of course, there was no sign of anybody wanting to mob him at all. We went down and there was one person wanting an autograph. And he sort of looked around rather disappointed, I think. And an agent smuggled us quickly out into a waiting limousine. And uh, he said, uh, where, where should we go? So I said, well, I don't know what you want to do that. He said, I fancy a cream tea. And these were these two rebellious schoolboys from If. I fancy a cream tea. Let's go to the Dorchester, he said. <laughs> and so we did. Um, but he hadn't changed. I mean, he's, 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 he was still the, the mad Malcolm that I knew and loved. Uh, so that, um, I think that taught me a lot without, because I didn't know what I was doing in that at all. And um, I think, Although we were both 24, a lot of people thought we were younger, but we were both 24. We were the oldest boys on the film. We were older than the whips, the, the prefects. Um, but uh, so, um, no, Aces High was, was uh, um, and the second one. The sec uh, se seven years later, I didn't do a film for seven years, and then it was back with Malcolm in Aces High, and that was great fun. Um, but uh, but uh, the... Uh, North Sea Hijack sort of came out of the blue, really. And um, as I say, I honestly believe that uh, they were desperate because uh, the mm -hmm. interview I had was so, so sudden. It was on the same day. Would I would I straight away go down to Pinewood? And I was collected in a car to go off to Galway about three days later. So um, I feel mm -hmm. very, very lucky. Mm -hmm. 
And, and, and uh, Jeremy, just sort of building what Dave was saying about some fan interactions, um, do you have any memorable encounters with, with fans, maybe maybe um, stemming from your from your music days or, or acting, <laughs> sort of, uh, perhaps anything you'd like to share? Something memorable, God, yes. Um, uh, well, I mean, it was like Hard Day's Night for me, but uh, that was briefly, briefly in my life. There was a point when that sort of thing was going on. There was a moment. Uh, we were, this is, this is, guys, we're off the subject now. This is nothing to do with North Sea Hijack or Mr. Tipping or anything else. But uh, in my, in another world, I worked with a guy called Chad and we were a duo and we had some hits um uh, in america and we were in fact the first english band of the what was to become known as the british invasion to be on the west coast because we were brought over to be on something called the hollywood palace show which was the um rival to the ed sullivan show on the east coast and the radio stations we didn't knew none of this had been plugging our arrival in la and when the, the, you know, we touch down uh, and the crew say to us, uh, you better stay behind. There's a bit of a reception, a bit of a reception. Oh, yeah, OK. All right. And so we get off at the, the plane and, wow, you know, it's women everywhere screaming. And um, then go through, I remember it was in an enclosed space to like an atrium with a, a staircase. They were on the staircase, the noise, unbelievable. And then we get we're straight through customs. I mean, no nonsense about that or any of that. I mean, sort of celebrity goes straight through and into the limos and then to the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. And all these girls had got their dad's car mm -hmm. and there were like six or eight of them in the car all sort of weaving in and out of the uh, on the freeway trip into LA uh, and you know we were kind of used to this because we'd had a bit of this in England because we'd had a hit record thing and um, but everybody else the guys from the label the the chauffeur uh, they're all terrified and we're you know and, and they're the girls are trying to touch they're trying to reach out they're coming close to the to the car and trying to touch by, by reaching out and we get to the Beverly Wilshire Hotel and the guys from the label, <laughs> sort of white with fear by this time, <laughs> say, guys, you've got to run for it, run for it. We'll, we'll hold them back. And you, we pulled in. I was there the other day, I mean, within uh, a few months ago and checked, looked at the front of the Beverly Wilshire to make sure my memory was correct. And it was a sort of pull in space. <laughs> And the girls, they've got their cars up on the pavement now, you know, sort of surrounding. The guys say, go on, run for it, run for it. And we open the door and we head for the double doors of the um, Beverly Wilshire Hotel. And there is a full wedding party coming out, filling, filling the, the, the front doors of the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. And we just go straight through them. We trash them. I mean, there were bridesmaids flying everywhere, you know, and, and followed by screaming girls. Um, and then security takes over and the sort of rest order is restored. We go up to our rooms, there's a laundry basket in the corridor. The basket, out comes a girl screaming from the basket. So yeah, I've, I've, I've yeah, that's fan stuff. Yes, I've had a bit of that. Uh, it, it doesn't happen so much nowadays, <laughs> <laughs> except that's not true because I'm off any minute now to uh, do a big 60s uh, sort of uh, reunion called mm. the Flower Power Cruise. And there's going to be, hang on, there's going to be, oh, Mickey Donuts of the Monkeys and the Zombies and Paul Jones and Peter Asher and myself and the occasional Buckingham and, you know, so on, so lots and lots of people. And mm. so it's like a sort of um, floating uh, festival, except you can't leave. I've, I've yet I've never done one of these before, so I'm sort of waiting to see. But anyway, there you are. That's wonderful. So uh, uh, does it mean that Chad and Jeremy and Peter and Gordon became Jeremy and Peter? Uh, no, they, 
Jeremy. And Peter and Jeremy, yes. Peter and Jeremy. It was because both Gordon left us, I don't know, 15 years ago now, Chad yeah. two years ago. And so it was an obvious thing. Peter and I are old friends anyway. And yeah. so now do that. That's another thing we do. That's not that's not Flower Power Cruise. That's a separate thing we're doing. I'm doing my own shows in the Flower Power Cruise. Um, but then we get together and we do our across America and do our uh, Peter and Jeremy show. And, you know, that for those that are have any interest in that period and all that, they get two for the price of one. It's hits, hits, hits and stories, stories, stories. So there you are. So that's so do you does does Peter sing Yesterday's Gone with you? Yeah. yeah. So, I, I, I sing the Gordon parts. Yeah. And he sings the Chad parts. Right. Obviously. Nice. Yeah, that's exactly. lovely. That's lovely. No, yeah. I, I remember, you know, that's very much my uh, yeah. when I well, I suppose I was I was 19 or 20, but I certainly remember Chad and Jeremy and Peter and Gordon very, very well. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's lovely that the, you, you've come together as it were. Well, it's what's extraordinary about it. What's extraordinary about it is this sort of bookends. I started out, you know, three years of drama school, year of Dundee rep, and then you won't you may not remember this because you're so young but there was a um there was a, a an equity strike the only time actors yeah. have been strike you remember this yeah. yeah and so i came back from dundee rep i was ready to take on the world that the west end was ready for me you know and actually no because nobody was working nothing mm -hmm. and so that's when i went back sort of and ch found Chad, who was miserable working as a pub in a publisher's doing copying, copying scores by hand, laborious sort of thing that they don't do now. And, um, and, you know, we had a little band and we had our act at drama school and all that. And so we went back to doing it. We had a lunchtime gig. And that's when John Barry, of the, the composer, uh, came down and saw us and signed us to his label, and that was that. And so it was all because the actors' strike had um, had intervened. And then suddenly, I'm off on this sort of amazing eight-year ride through the sixties. Go back to, you know, think oh, this is ridiculous. This isn't. This cannot last. I mean, and you know, we our records were not selling the way they used to. And so ended, went back to the acting. From time to time, Chad and I would get together again because we missed it. We missed the whole thing. But you know, the, the, um, you know, the parade's gone by rather. Uh, and then um, now, you know, and I'm not getting much work as an actor because there's not the parts. And I've got the music. It's unbelievable. It's like sort of you know, it's a bookend. Anyway, yeah. there we are. That's all about me. But well, let's let's talk about North Sea Hijack. I'm supposed isn't that what I was supposed to talk about? <laughs> No, it was it, no. It's fascinating. I mean, because my life got taken over by children's theatre. Well, I remember your your children's theatre and your children's books. If I remember, was that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. The, the, there were both, but the children's theatre tag, yeah. as it were, um, that started when I was in rep at uh, Worcester, uh, 1967. I wrote my first children's play, so it's 56 years ago. And uh, and I've written about 75 of these plays. But what is extraordinary is the fact that they don't date in the same way as grown up plays. Well, actually, and, uh, actually, hang on, hang on. I'm interested. But does that mean you have not had to rewrite them in the manner of Roald Dahl? <laughs> well, I adapted eight Roald Dahl titles for the stage. OK. Uh, the BFG was 1991 and the Witches 1992. And then from then on, I did the Twits. I did Fantastic Mr. Fox, Danny the Champion of the yep. World. And they were all done um, on tour, several in the West End. And uh, though I say it myself, they were very successful. And uh, oh, someone's come in and play Professor Bosch. Professor Bosch, it just came out. Yeah. That was in my Alan Pussycat went to see, my word. That was the very, well, that was the second one. That was 1968. And um, we brought it to London in 1969. Um, but uh, they, my plays, they're still done, although uh, things have moved on because when Matilda came along, mm. uh, in spite of the fact that I had worked on a version of Matilda with Styles and Drew, who are the two who did the extra songs for Mary Poppins and they wrote Honk for the National and Betty Blue Eyes and so on. 
And uh, this was years ago. For this was for Cameron Macintosh. And uh, anyway, the Dahl, uh, Felicity Dahl, Dahl's widow, didn't like some of the songs or something, so we didn't do it. And eventually the RSC did it, and the rest is history, and it's huge. Yeah. But it's not the show I would have written because it's a family musical rather than a children's show. Um, but uh, I have, all, they're all published and they're all still done and the amateurs all do them. And I've just mm. heard that there's a company in Philadelphia who are going to do the BFG, a, a big production in the uh, autumn. Uh, but um, the irony is, is that nobody has come to me and said, we're going to change some of the language in your adaptations. And I've yeah. been waiting for this to happen. Yes, yes. And I've got four Puffin books which are my adaptations of my adaptation, which I did for schools to do, making it into playlists and so on. And there's James and the Giant Peach, BFG, Witches and the Twits. And in all four, there are examples of this so-called um, language problem. Uh, but Puffin haven't been in touch. They haven't got in touch and said, oh, we're going to change it. So I'm crossing my fingers that they won't, because uh, some of them are quite extraordinary. Some yes. of the changes they yeah. made. But um, I, it, it's, it's my opinion. I mean, I guess maybe it's just a bit, uh, uh, an age thing, but I think children like cruelty. Mm. They, 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 it, children are not little sweety things. I mean, they like to, you know, point at people and, you know, it's not. So I'm, I'm sort of, it just, it's all a little bit... Um, what they are. Horrible histories, for example, has well, has, yes, absolutely. I mean, my my grandchildren are all deeply into horrible yeah. histories. Yes, and, the, the the gore they like, but the main thing for me has always been that children have this extraordinary innate sense of justice, of fairness, yes. and therefore, Dahl was extremely moral in the sense that all the nasty characters get their comeuppance. And that's the whole point of it. That's what the children want. They want to yes. see the yes. Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker or the uh, the Grand High Witch or whoever it may be. They want to see them um, uh, having their faces rubbed in the mud and so on. And, and Dahl does that. And I think that's why he was so popular. Mm -hmm. um, and and there, there's a melodramatic quality. They're all over the top characters. They're um, uh, and again, I mean, you look at most of the main characters in English literature and they're all slightly over the top, it's slightly exaggerated, and that's what sort of makes them work. Um, but uh, but anyway, sorry, we're off the point again, but that <laughs> I, I got hijacked and all see hijacked into doing yeah. it. and uh, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, that, that's that's the way I've been. And I've currently got The Tiger Who Came to Tea, which I've done for the last 15 years. I direct my own adaptation. It's mm. been on tour, apart from the pandemic, for 15 years. It's been in the West End seven times. Um, it's a 55-minute show for three-year-olds, as it were. And yeah. to me, it's one of the best things, if not the best thing I've ever done. It's a sort of consummation of, that's the wrong word, but it's a, um, a, a, a it's putting an amalgam of everything I've ever learned in mm -hmm. one sure. show and uh, and it seems to work so uh, and, and I still get I was in Norwich Theatre Royal on Saturday with a full house of 1300 plus people um, reacting and most of them you know very young with with parents but um, but it was the most wonderful um, re reaction and I, mm -hmm. I get a huge buzz out of that um, but so that doesn't mean to say that all the acting thing wasn't important because it certainly was because that's certainly what I wanted to do in the first place but mm. uh, but I think to have another string to the bow in your case the music and my yeah. the other um, yeah. I mean if I ever talk to drama students I always say for god's sake get something else or plan your own one-man show or something go to Edinburgh do it or whatever rather than just waiting for the phone to ring and even yes. with a mobile it's not going yeah. to ring maybe as often as you'd hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, decreasingly anyway. Mm. Yeah. So, Philip. Um, we, you, you, I just said, you, you mentioned political correctness um, with, with language and, uh, and such, but also there's been a, a lot of, um, uh, of oh, cr criticism of, say, straight actors playing gay parts or um, non-disabled actors playing disabled parts. Do you think, of course, acting, surely the whole point of acting is to play something other than your yourself. 
what, what do what do both of you think about that kind of sort of um, <laughs> issues at the moment? Well, it's, 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 you're, you're asking us to tread into a, a mine of... Um, oh, but briefly, of course. But, uh, yeah. Yes, it's horrendous. <laughs> I, I do find it difficult that, uh, although I totally approve of everybody having a fair chance at everything, mm. uh, I, I do find it quite tricky when um, uh, a gay actor must play a gay part and a straight mm. actor can't play it. Whereas if you take that round the other way and you say that uh, as, as, um, a gay actor can't play a straight part, uh, mm. there would be, oh, hell would be let loose if you said that. Um, mm. I think that uh, uh, the, 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 the whole situation is, it's, it, it's, it's like a, um, what is it when you, uh, the, the pendulum. The, goes one way i mean i, I think we're uh, we're very much in one sphere at the moment and i think it'll probably ad adjust itself in time um but again you know it, it's rather going back to the uh the the dudley moore and peter cook sketch of the, the long john silver sketch you know uh, in order to play long john silver do you have yep. to have a leg removed or do you have to be mm -hmm. a one-legged person um I, I I don't know. Uh, there was a there was a play in the West End not long ago, and a friend of mine who's who's my age uh, was playing someone in a wheelchair, hmm. an elderly man in a wheelchair. Uh, but he is extremely mobile and and fit. And in the course of rehearsal, the director said, "When you are pushed in in the wheelchair." Uh, for your first scene, he said, "I want you to stand up out of the wheelchair and uh, and just do a couple of steps uh, in order to adjust uh, to take your coat off or whatever before going back down into the wheelchair." And he said, "Why? Why on earth do you want me to do that?" So he said, "Well, he said, I I want to find a reason for an able-bodied person to be playing this part in a wheelchair. Therefore, you've got to prove that." There is a reason in the play why you need to be able to walk just a little way. Uh, otherwise, people will complain that um, uh, we haven't got somebody who is really in a wheelchair. Um, well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, and there are lots of other examples, I'm sure Jeremy's got to. No, no, quote. I'm saying I'm, you've done brilliantly. I'm staying right out of this one. <laughs> but I'm, I'm with you, of course. Hmm. I can, I, how, there's one or two instances where I can see I mean, for example, if you're doing a play about somebody with Down syndrome, um, I would hate to think of somebody who isn't with Down syndrome all sort of done up in some sort of latex or something. That would be appalling. So yes. I, can, I can see certain instances, but I think there's a sort of a kind of, a kind of madness is upon us, which I think will, yeah. as you said, I think the pendulum is going to swing back a bit. Yeah. No, uh, I actually wrote a, um, a short film for the European Union, the children's department or whatever, where they all get together and every country puts in a half hour children's film uh, with as much uh, action or as little dialogue, put it that way, as little dialogue as possible so that they're international. And I wrote this thing about a Down syndrome boy who uh, whose dream was, if you like, to be in the Olympics, who loved watching uh, Olympics on the thing. And um, uh, it, it was shot with a Down syndrome boy, uh, John, who was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Uh, it won awards in Europe, mainly, I think, because of his performance. The fascinating thing was, was that on location, you would shoot the scene once. And for him, that was it. He'd done it. And so he'd say, what's next? You know, what, what do we do now? What do we do now? And they, they said, no, well, no, actually, we've got to shoot it again from another angle. And, and he couldn't understand. They found that very difficult. So they ended up, because they didn't have two cameras or anything, they ended up um, trying to do as few setups as possible on each um, uh, scene that he was in, in order to not get him stressed because he was having to repeat himself. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, it worked. It worked terribly well. Um, so I know I think you're absolutely right. 
Um, of course, Eddie Redmayne is now saying that he would not have, um, which is the one that... that uh, um, oh, Alan, it's not Alan Turing, no. Um, no, they were the, 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 the Dutch, the, the girl. Um, oh, where? Oh, God. What's, well, people can uh, write in and tell us what it was. But yeah. uh, playing a transvestite type yeah. character. Yes, I never uh, saw it. Never he's saw the it. Danish girl. Thank you very much. Well, um, well. Uh, he now says that he would not have accepted the role, that that was wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, he did um, the uh, uh, my, 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 my Stephen Hawking film. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. That's what I was I, uh, I was Now, was he right or wrong to do that? I honestly don't. Of course don't. he was right to do that. Of course he was right to do that. Mm. Uh, but yes, I mean... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, we're going to shut up on that, Philip. Now, okay. for that well, question, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to the um, matter in hand. Um, Jeremy, I wanted to ask you: Do you remember Faith Brook at all? Who played the? I knew Prime Faith Minister? Brook. I knew her before um, before we did the, the film, because uh, mm. my dad was a film producer, and I he had worked with her. I had met her socially, so and it was kind of extraordinary suddenly to you know having been. Tommy's boy, and suddenly there I am being the Lord Privy Seal and making a right hash of it. Anyway, um, so yeah, no, I, I did know Faith Brook, and I think I, I think I worked with her a couple of other times, and she was very, very nice, liked her very much. Hmm. Um, and interestingly, it's, it is, you would know, it was Margaret Thatcher on the throne, as we might say, uh, at the time, or was that being was that way way before? It's way before. It was quite quite a few years. Quite before. a way before. Yeah, so it was that's quite. A, that's exactly yeah. yes. So that's that's extraordinary and and very uh, well done. Yeah, mm. yeah. Yes. Uh, now, was that in the book? I wonder, or whether it was. Uh, yes, uh, Philip. Do you know? Uh, I'm I'm not sure. I haven't actually. Um, unfortunately, read, read read the novels. I'm not sure where they say that that comes from um but it was 79 that uh yeah. the film would have been been made for an 80 release um my po political history is a bit sort of shaky so i'm not but you know sort of um it certainly would have been quite um, unusual to have yeah. well, whether it was more because of um roger moore's character being very not anti-women but he had some issues whether it was yes one yes, of those things true. designed to bounce awesome. off him yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, rather than say a, a political sort of statement, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing. But uh, um, uh, and, and David, do you remember uh, Jack Watson? who played the, um, the, the ship. Yes, captain? he was lovely. I mean, we didn't have much of a conversation, really. He was um, uh, he was terribly good because he was he was a, one of these wonderful, reliable, solid character actors who um, did everything, really. And uh, and he played the, the this captain. He had a, a a strange accent, and I didn't know quite what it was at the beginning when he started doing it. But it was meant to be sort of Norwegian, which I think must be rather difficult. Um, <laughs> uh, in fact, several people had to use that accent, and uh, I don't know whether they would have won a prize for it. I think with varying degrees of success, I'd say probably, <laughs> probably just like my Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes yeah, so you see they should have had a scottish actor they, we, uh, yeah you see shouldn't they, they should i shouldn't have. have i shouldn't have got the role no yeah I mean, was there any reason uh david that you had to play it scottish or was it kind of sorry i didn't hear that one i was just wondering what was there any sort of reason why you, you had you had to play it with, with with your accent or was it kind of well, I was told that that was the part that he was. That was the part. He, yeah. he was a, he was Scottish, and um, yeah, yeah. Mm, uh, but uh, no, I, I no idea. But it's it's one of the things that you you do. You put, used to put it in spotlight. Any accents you could do, or, right. or you could smoke or something. Smoking a speciality. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe, maybe now you see you uh, have to be the real thing. Now, tell mm. me, sorry, David, you mentioned horses. That been a, was that a problem for you? Horses? Oh my Riding. god! Well, 
Uh, Jack Gold. Did you ever work for Jack Gold, Jeremy? He was. Uh, but I know uh, who you mean. He was the loveliest, loveliest man and a, a, a very good director. And um, I got asked to do this mad Jack. And uh, at the interview, he said, do you, can you ride a horse? And, you know, we're always told, <laughs> say yes. So I did. And I got the part. And I realised, reading the script, that uh, riding a horse was quite important. <laughs> and there was a scene where Michael Jason and I had to approach each other on horseback, have a conversation, and then turn and go back the way we come. Well, I signed up for some lessons. I had 10 days and, uh, and I had a couple of lessons uh, at the end of which I could just about, well, I, I, I couldn't trot, I don't think, let alone canter, let alone gallop. Uh, mm. But um, I could just about stay on the horse. So we arrived in um, Weymouth and uh, uh, I didn't sleep. Uh, but the next morning there we were on the location and this um, very... Uh, a very nice man came up and said, hello, hello, I, I run the local riding school here and uh, you're using our horses today. So I realised that they weren't specially trained film horses. And he said, now I've got your horse here, it's called Paddy Punch. Uh, he said, and, and Paddy Punch, he, he's, he's quite old. He said, he doesn't get out much, but when he does get out, my, he enjoys it. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I got up on this wretched horse, oh dear. and. Uh, well, we, we, we tried to do the scene and Michael, Michael Jaston was a very good horseman. I found that out. And we came to Wiltshire and we started talking and of course, I went straight past. So we tried it again. And this time they said, can you go a bit faster? So I tried to go a bit faster and shot past him without <laughs> turning around right in the other direction until we reached a tree, luckily, and the horse shied up and I slid off the back. And the next thing, I was lying on the ground and Jack came up and said, are you all right? And I said, oh, yes, I think so. He said, well, let's do it again then. And so on we went. And uh, eventually they, the torture stopped. But I felt very guilty. Uh, well, a few weeks later, my agent rang up and said, oh, uh, David, they want you to go back to Weymouth to reshoot a scene where you're on a horse. I said, oh, my God, no, really? So I went down again didn't sleep went in the same hotel and arrived on the location and looked around there was jack and there was michael and there were a few other people and no horses and i thought well can this can this be true and jack bless him he said right he said um get up on my shoulders he said and michael said you get up on that grip's shoulders and so one of the cameramen and uh so he, they jigged around <laughs> and we did the scene like that and when you see the finished product uh, it perfect it looks just okay. like we're on horseback and mm. uh, we could have avoided all the problems i suppose well no they they did use the shots of a horse of me on the horse speeding past but the actual conversation they did like that and uh, and i uh, well i was always in debt to jack and then when he asked me to do Aces High, which was a few years later, I jumped at the chance, and uh, and there were no horses involved. There were just um, SE five First World War planes, <laughs> which we weren't insured okay. to do anything with apart from to sit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And one of my favourite scenes of of, of yours, Jamie, in, in the film is when you're in the helicopter with Roger Moore, and he's doing the the the, the stitching of uh, you know the, the the cat he's trying to make and. You've got um, James Mason, of course, on the other side. Did, did, does that ring a bell with you? Well, that was yes. That, that was that was the moment when I came. In, I came in and I was late, and everybody went whoa, you know. Well, and, scene, yeah. and, and so and then I then I had to get into the helicopter and play all that stuff. I mean, all that stuff and looking over, you know, it's, uh, pretend it's right down there. And actually, we were in a studio. I mean, you know, sitting on the floor, you know. Um, <laughs> And all that. Uh, yes, I, I, I just, it was, it was my shame. That was the moment of my shame. <laughs> I, I do, I do remember it. And um, yeah, I mean, anyway, there you are. I just wish, I mean, I look back now, the Lord Privy Seal, and I had a very, very face strange haircut, which I, I'm, uh, it doesn't, it's very odd. I mean, what am I doing? I do not know. Anyway, there we are. Uh, 
but uh, people seem to remember the film with great with great with great fondness it's it's a bit of a sort of quiet classic in its strange way which is odd because as far as i'm concerned it's a meat and potatoes movie you know <laughs> it's um you know nothing too subtle there except there are there are things and roger's lovely uh, in it it's lovely yeah. great I mean, I think it, it does hold up very well. You sort of watch, and I, I, I don't think it loses any of its of its quality um, over the years. Oh, and oh. but from the music to the directing, it's all you know top notch. Uh, who made the decision to for Michael Parks to have those strange glasses? <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of and my mm. hair, fine, that's pretty bad. Then there's his glasses. I mean, mm. it was a, why? Why are you with these ridiculous pebble lenses, Michael? What are you doing? Whose idea was that? Who knows? I don't know. Uh, lost in the mists of time. These decisions, you know, uh, acting decisions, and it's terrible. I mean, one of the great things about, I mean, if you were an actor before our time, nobody, because before the age of certainly talking pictures, there was nobody there to tell you that you were, or you could, you, you could be believe that those early performances of yours were absolutely marvelous <laughs> because there was not there was the evidence which did not exist to the contrary, and that's one of the little uh, things uh, as you get a little older and uh, the evidence is, is um, brought up for you. I mean, I've, I've got a few of them. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's an awful lot. Television-wise, got wiped, didn't it? Uh, yes, an awful mm -hmm. lot of stuff which. Uh, which which we did probably which uh, is is no longer in existence at all um and and some of the things uh some of the things turn up suddenly um the the uh i did a i did that jack and Ori, which was jack and Ori 3000 yeah. uh and it was a very special jack and Ori, the 3000th program or whatever and they actually had four of us reading the hobbit and it was Bernard Cribbins, Jan oh. Francis, uh, Maurice Denham, and me. Oh. And yeah. it, it was a joy, absolute joy. Yeah. We did it at yeah. Lime Grove over a weekend, and there were 10 episodes, 10 15 minute episodes. And um, uh, as far as I know, they did try to keep it and try to get it released on, I suppose, what would it be on video? It would have been then. Hmm. Uh, but the Tolkien estate refused because they said there were so many versions of The Hobbit, they didn't want another one. But they did release it on uh, a CD, uh, the BBC, uh, and um, only about three or four years ago. And I mean, this was uh, 30 years on. And uh, so uh, little things like that sometimes happen. And then you find people, somebody got in touch the other day and they said, um, uh, via my website, and they said, do you remember you were in the Record Breakers Christmas show with Roy Castle in 19, whatever it was. Um, they said, uh, uh, we've got a, a copy. We, we recorded it somehow off the screen. Would you like it? And I said, oh, yes, please. And it came. And uh, I couldn't remember anything that I'd done in the programme at all. But it was a lovely thing. It was all the children's presenters. We used to <laughs> all get together. There was the Blue Peter people, Johnny Morris, yes. uh, Cribbins again, um, all the play school people. And I was, yeah. I was play away, really. I used to do play away. And um, uh, and it was great fun. And, and it was we, you used to get paid properly because if you did a children's programme, on your contract was stamped the words special low. And there was nothing special about it. It just meant you got less money than you would for the equivalent length of programme if it was an adult programme. Mm. But the Record Breakers Christmas show was actually done by LE, Light Entertainment. And so we were all on contracts where we were getting about four times as much as we would yeah. for a children's programme. So they were lovely to do. Uh, but um, most, of, most of my early stuff was all gone. Um, and I think probably like you, <laughs> they're really quite, quite relieved. Yes, um, I think so. <laughs> there was the last time, Philip, you and I met when we did my episode, I say my, but the episode I was in of the New Avengers. Mm. Um, of course, they're all still going strong and they've all, uh, they, you know, they're on all the time. Um, but there aren't that many series like that. Um, because if you think of things like The Troubleshooters, 
Um, I don't think there'd be any episodes of that uh, lurking around in, in yeah. somebody's shed. Uh, yes. um, and, uh, and I did a, an episode of a series called Menace, which was rather a splendid script by Nigel Neal of Quatermass fame. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And uh, it was uh, Patrick Troughton. Yeah. And, and uh, it was a lovely thing. I think it really was rather good. But that's gone. That's uh, that's yeah. no longer there. Because they used to record over the videotape, didn't they? That's right. I, remem yeah. I remember all these conversations about how we're reusing the tape and uh, we can't afford to keep it. And you've no idea the storage and all this kind of stuff. And then there was talk. There, there was a there was talk of the back BBC television centre, right, with the fountain in the middle. And there were stories that the fountain in the middle was always leaking because and into the store into the storerooms underneath the fountain, which was part of the part of the that's where they had. And then there was always a crisis going on. And no, no, they think we can't afford to keep them. And, and terrible. There were some good things I would like. I would there are a few things. I well, I don't know. I mean, not not to do with me particularly, but I was in the things that I thought were good. Mm -hmm. uh, um, anyway, there we are. Yeah, no, it's yeah. a shame. No, but it was always rather nice um, doing stuff at, at the television centre, and and you knew you'd made it when you had one of those dressing rooms that went round overlooking the, that fountain right. on, on right. the ground floor, rather right. than being in the basement. And or, nice. or yes, yes, or to put it another way. I can remember being more frightened sitting in those rooms <laughs> about to go on and do something. The anticipation. And scary, particularly if it was particularly if it was comedy done in front of an audience, you know, and you've only got the one time. And, mm, mm. You know, anyway. Yes, yeah. yes uh, and that thing too of uh, rehearsing at Acton. Yes. Uh, the, yeah. the, the rehearsal rooms at Acton where they had three rehearsal rooms per floor and there were about six floors. And you'd go up to the canteen and there'd be the dad's army table there and there'd be uh, the Morecambe and Wise table yeah. there and uh, Dixon and Doc Green would be over there. Uh, it, it was quite extraordinary. And you very often got your next job too from that because yeah. all the directors were up there. Um, no, I think uh, I, I, I missed that. And it was such a good thing because before, I remember the first telly I did was a Z Cars and we rehearsed in a territorial army hall in... Acton and actually all the regulars loved it because there was a snooker table and they all knew exactly yeah. where they were and it was fine and I think they resented it when they were forced to come to Acton to uh, rehearse there but um uh but these drafty church halls that they always used to use and suddenly this wonderful block of specialist rooms I, I remember I remember so well and it was like the best club in London because you'd meet all your friends there mm. or and and the gossip was high grade you know what's going on exactly and you could pick up tips and you know for another job indeed yeah yeah yes well my favorite story was um gareth hunt you remember gareth hunt very well very well, well get, get, we were in a an episode well in, in a series called the love school which was all about the pre-raphaelites yes and um it, uh rob knights was directing one and piers haggard was directing one yes and uh, I was, as usual, playing uh, the brother of Millet, Millet's brother, Peter Egan, had the main role. Right. Uh, but it was, it was great fun. And we went filming in Scotland, but we, we certainly rehearsed in action and we were on the first floor. And, uh, and the canteen was on the seventh floor. And, uh, and I came down after lunch one day and uh, seconds later, Gareth Hunt walked in the door pale as a sheep and I said what's what's what, what on earth's the matter so he said well he said it's the most extraordinary thing he said I got in the lift from the canteen and he said and I came down here and in the space of those six floors he said I've got three episodes of Doctor Who and uh, <laughs> apparently Barry Letts Barry Letts was in the lift and said oh you look right oh who's your agent or something he said I'll get in touch with your agent for Doctor Who and it, I'm sure enough, <laughs> Um, yeah. No, I think this is what used to happen. It was great. Yeah, I know. I know. I miss it. I agree. <laughs> Do you have any memories of of Gav Hunt, Jeremy? Of, of what? Oh, of, of Gav Hunt, as as we were, as we mentioning him. Do you remember um, Gav? Hunt? I, I was I was in a play with Gareth for a year in London uh, called mm. Conduct Unbecoming, mm. 
Uh, so I have very, yes, I remember Garage. Eight times a week, I remember Garage for a year. Um, <laughs> yes. Did you do it at Bristol, Jeremy? Did you do the what? original at Bristol? Yes, I did. Yes, yes, well, I saw you there then. I saw it in Bristol and uh, enjoyed it very much. Val May, was Val May directed? Val May directed. And there was, um, I'm good. I think we, are we coming to the end of this? Oh, oh, oh yeah, 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 absolutely, yes. I think we yeah. probably are. But anyway, let me just finish with this. Oh, please do, please do. Is, is that um, we, so we, we, Bristol, as you said, Bristol Ovic, and then to the Queen's Theatre in Shaftesbury Avenue. And then on to Broadway uh, for some of us, the, the top liners. And uh, which, so it was, it was a, like two years of my life, extraordinary. And they used to put, um, you know, reviews outside the theatre as they do. You know, the most, most marvelous. I laughed, I, you know, outrageously or whatever. You know, fifteen stars, whatever. And this, in this case, they had all that. Most the best play in London, all that. And then they'd have little quotes from the um from the reviews about some of the actors in it and so for an entire year if you came up shaftesbury avenue you would come across right in front of you and it said jeremy clyde is the epitome of weedy arrogance <laughs> <laughs> which is with, uh, with i may say you know, sort of marks in, you know, quotation. <laughs> but it was, Jeremy Clyde is the epitome of weedy arrogance, and I have it in my bathroom. I have all my jokes in the bathroom. And it's it's on the bar, it's on the, it's one of my good, better gags. Um, <laughs> and on that note, gentlemen. It's a great yeah, compliment. It's a great arrogant compliment. <laughs> That's a, a great, a great uh, point to end up. I mean, is there any final comments here if you'd like to make about Norsi Hijack before we go, or...? Uh... No, I've sort of squeezed all the juice I possibly can out of out of Dorsey Hijack. I mean, and I just saw it this afternoon, thanks to you, uh, actually, I mean, most of it, um, to, to remind myself of what it was like. But I mean, it, it, the thing that, you know, Tim and, and David, that it's a different experience if you're on location. Mm. They were on location. They were having all the fun with the stuntmen and the dramas and the crack in the pub later and all the rest of it. And it's, it's, and, and we were just, you know, knocking out the scenes back in Pinewood. It's, it's a completely, so yeah, to me, it's just like a few days of job, interesting people, very impressed, um, didn't know what I was doing, got, got late one day from, from lunch. That was sort of my, my view of the subject. Mm. Um, and, but I have done other things in, on location, which have been, which are sort of seared in the memory, but that's all to do with offstage stuff a lot of it. There you are. Mm. And, and David, any any closing mark? No, I, I I agree with that. No, I I feel we were lucky those of us that were on location. Uh, I wish we didn't have to go uh, looking for bad weather in an oil rig supply <laughs> vessel for quite so many days. Yes. Um, but uh, never no that nevertheless, um, I look back on it with um, uh, with pleasure, and I think it, it was a different experience for me from the other films that I had done. And I only did three or four films, but it was a different experience because it was an American director. It was a big sort of action director who'd worked with, I don't know, John Wayne and all these yeah. big people. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know, you felt you were a part of a slightly different machine, I suppose. Um, but he was very pleasant um, and, uh, and very efficient. Uh, I mean, I think they probably came in on time. I think they, yeah. they got a lot done in spite yeah, of the yeah. fact that they were looking for bad weather <laughs> mm. um, and and didn't very often find it, to be honest. But um, uh, no, I think a lot of people do um, uh, say nice things about the film. And uh, and I think of it, of its genre, uh, it, it, it is a very respected Film and I do think, as what Tim said earlier, I do think that Roger Moore was rather extraordinary in it because yes. he was very, very different from anything that anyone had seen before, and he was brave enough 
yeah. to be that different, you know, yeah. wearing that woolly hat with a pom-pom or something on the top yeah. and yeah. playing with the cats and doing yeah. the embroidery yeah. in the train. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, we, we must salute that because mm -hmm. um, I don't know who persuaded him to do it or whether he needed persuading. Maybe he was thrilled uh, to, to get the chance of doing something yeah. different. And, and he was very funny, too. I mean, there's a lot of humour in there, Yes, um, which he, he, he did really very well. But yeah. uh, no, happy days, happy memories. Yes, indeed. Well, well, thanks very much, guys, for um, spending so much of your time talking about the, the film and so many other wonderful things. It's been a, a real pleasure to speak to you uh, both this evening. Thanks, Philip. Okay. Thanks, Philip, very much. David. Nice to see you, David. Again. Very nice to see you, Jeremy. Bye. All the very best. Bye, bye boy. <laughs> Take care, guys. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Goodbye.